How you doing, guys? How are you, everybody? We have a Mohammedan who contacted me on Skype who's manifesting and barking, so let me invite him. This is earlier than I wanted. I was going to go two hours from now because I have another session with Robert Spencer. So, guys, do me a favor as I send the link to this Mohammedan wicked blasphemer to see how long he's going to last. Hit the like button, please, if you can. Cat needs attention now. Yeah, I'm Sheikh Abbas and Spirit. So, guys, do me a favor. Please hit the like button. Share this link on your social media platforms. I know I ask many of you to do it. I don't know how many of you do. That's between you and the Lord. But if you believe that God is using me, then invite them. And it's going to be open Q&A as well. I'm going to give you the link in a minute. We'll talk about a variety of topics, God willing, Lord willing. So hit the like button, share. If you believe God is using me in this ministry for the glory of Jesus Christ, let's make these sessions go viral and get more subscribers for the glory of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, not for my praise. May God destroy our pride, our arrogance, our ego, purify our motives. Then be prayed up, which is the most important thing you can do is be prayed up. Ask the Spirit to fill every one of us. Scott, good to see you, brother. In a few hours from now, Scott, if you go to my YouTube channel, Scott, I love you. You're one of my mods and you're killing me. If you go to my YouTube channel, Scott, check every day, check regularly, hit the notification. But I know I'm shadow banned, so you don't get notified. But go to my YouTube channel. I already announced beforehand when I'm planning to do a stream, if the Lord Jesus wills. So already have it scheduled. Robert Spencer is going to talk about his critical Quran. It's already scheduled. So hit the like button. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, be prayed up. <clears throat> the most important thing you can do for me is to pray. The Holy Spirit fill all of us. The Holy Spirit comes to the forefront. He teaches that I'm not self-deceived, that I'm truly a vessel of the Spirit, glorifying Jesus Christ in spite of my sins. And the Spirit will teach all of us, teach in and through me, teach all of us. We are the disciples of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're not my disciples. Even though a lot of our haters Cannot stand it when I call people Sola Widian or Tota Widian, followers of James White or Rogerians, man worshipers who idolize people like Anthony Rogers. So what do they do? They try to return the favor and call you Shamunians. Do not allow yourselves to be called Shamunians. You're not my disciples. Do not let anyone say you are my dis disciples and do not call yourselves my disciples. And there's no need for you to defend me in the comment sections of these trolls. Don't. The only time you can defend me if they slander and accuse me of some vile, immoral sin. That's a different story. Just like I won't allow anyone to slander my daughters or let's say my mother when they're lying, that's different. But don't go and defend me or my teachings if they say I'm a false teacher, I'm a heretic. That's okay. One man's saint is another man's heretic. Do not be Shamunians. In Jesus' name, by the Holy Spirit, only time you defend me if they lie about me, right? Like they say, I'm a thief, I robbed a bank, or I murdered someone, or I committed adultery and slept with a man's wife. That's the only time you defend me because that would be a lie and slander. But if they say I'm a false teacher and a heretic, okay, so what? Whoopie do. Be zealous for the truth of the faith. Be zealous for the glory of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. Be zealous for the Bible and what it teaches, as long as you understand what it teaches accurately and seek to live it out, even though God doesn't need us. Be zealous for the glory of the Lord. All right. So with that said, once we start, focus. I'm going to open up the Q&A. So focus. Pray the Holy Spirit will constrain me and control me so I can stay focused. But let's pray. And pray for my health. God, give me perfect self-control, self-restraint, self-discipline to keep the weight off, to stay healthy, and pray for my holiness and purity to truly love Jesus and be a doer of his word, not a hypocrite, and pray that God will save us from satanic temptation and scandal, and the Lord bless my daughters, and strengthen my throat with the health I need to serve you for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in the matchless, glorious, beautiful, holy, sovereign name of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. <clears throat> Enable us to love you, Father, <clears throat> perfectly. Enable us to love you, Lord Jesus, perfectly. Enable us to love you, Holy Spirit, perfectly. And strengthen us. Control our carnal tongues and our carnal mouths. Control the words of our tongues and our mouths. Cleanse our tongues and our mouths in the blood of Jesus Christ. Purge our tongues and mouths, our flesh, and the holy fire of the Holy Spirit, that no wicked, filthy, idolatrous, blasphemous word will ever come out of our mouths, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, and destroy our lusts. Destroy the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh. Destroy our pride, our arrogance, our ego, our false sense of humility, our false sense of piety and spirituality, our false <clears throat> humbleness. Please, Father, please, Son of God, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, grant us true humility and humbleness and true spirituality, true piety and true <clears throat> worship and religion, religion that delights your heart, Father, your heart, Lord Jesus, your heart, Holy Spirit. Enable us to resist Satan and hate him with perfect hatred and to crucify our flesh and despise our flesh and overcome our flesh and not to succumb to our flesh. Destroy the stain and the fruits of our flesh and fill us with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Joy, love, peace, self-control, self-restraint, self-discipline, holiness, righteousness, purity, love, devotion, <clears throat> patience, discipline. <clears throat> Compassion and mercy, everything that delights you, <clears throat> enable us <clears throat> to continue to grow in those areas that delight your heart and hate what you hate and resist all that seeks <clears throat> to cause us to stumble and sin against you because we need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Teach us how to pray, how to praise, how to worship, how to study the word. And enable us to meditate on the word and perfect my ability to recall scriptures perfectly without error, not for my glory or my fame. Destroy our false sense of humility. Destroy our false inclinations and motives, not to do it for money or status or position. And do not allow us to fall into any scandal and shame Jesus Christ, Lord. Save us, preserve us, protect us from our own flesh and from Satan and from wicked dogs, false brethren, wolves in sheep's clothing. Protect women from men who are of the devil seeking to devour them. And protect us from Jezebels who want to destroy us. Please, Father. Please, Son of God, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. We trust in you. We depend on you. We cling to you. We cleave to you. <clears throat> destroy our fears and our doubts on belief. Do not allow us to ever betray or deny or blaspheme or disown or shame the name of Jesus Christ. Loosen my tongue. Anoint my mouth to speak clearly, accurately coherently, without error, without stammering, without stuttering, without confusion, without misinterpretation, to recall and interpret scriptures perfectly. Remove the veil from our eyes. Open our ears to hear your voice, Father, which is the voice of Jesus and the voice of the Holy Spirit. And your voice rings loudly and perfectly in the Holy Bible, your perfect word. Enslave us to that voice. Empower us by that voice, to be in love with that voice, controlled by that voice, that your voice will control our passions so we don't sin against you and shame you, Father. Then we don't shame you, Lord Jesus. We don't shame you, Holy Spirit. And to recall your voice in Scripture and proclaim without shame, without fear, without compromise, even if they beat us or torture us or kill us, fill us with that same glorious Holy Spirit that you filled the holy prophets, such as Joseph, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Micah, all of them, as you filled the holy apostles, Paul, our hero, and the church fathers, fill us as you fill them, not for the praise of men, but to show and convince ourselves that we do love you and we're not lip service. And we're willing to lose everything for you. We cannot do it without you, Father. We cannot do it. I can't do it without you, Lord Jesus. I can't. We cannot do it without you, Holy Spirit. Please do not give us what we deserve, but give us your love, your compassion, and your mercy. And destroy gossip and slander. Destroy false witness Destroy envy and jealousy and maliciousness and idolatry to speak the truth and to be patient and loving and compassionate even with those that we disagree with if they're of the household of the faith. But these dogs empower us to muzzle them without caring about what people think as long as we delight your heart 
Father, which is the heart of your Son, the Lord Jesus, the heart of your Holy Spirit. That's what matters. Strengthen the internet connection. Bless the audio and visual quality. Strengthen my throat. Fill my lungs, my chest, my heart, and arteries with the health I need. Make my voice powerful and passionate, pleasing to the ears of your sons and daughters, Father. Those purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, born of your spirit, born of your love. And I pray I'm born of your spirit, born of your love. Have your way. Beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ, the love, holiness, compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may he shine in us and may he increase, may we decrease. Take over the ministry, take over our lives, our possessions, the lives of our loved ones. My daughters, they are yours forever and ever. We need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. So in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the name of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Bring them for your glory, not for my praise. Amen. It's a little earlier. I didn't want to go this early. I was going to go a little later and about two hours from now, but we got a Mohammedan barking. So now I'm going to invite him. Let's see if he can defend his filth, his trash. And here's the link. We're going to open up the Q&A. And there's a lot of topics for me to talk about. So I didn't want to go this early, but because of this barking dog, barking like his prophet, and I'm going to have to muzzle him by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ without shame, without <clears throat> seeking to be politically correct or to tickle ears, as long as I don't sin in my anger against the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit. May he constrain me from grieving the spirit. That's all that matters, right, in Jesus' name. So I decided to hasten the session because I don't want to go now. I think Rob Christian's on, and I want to interrupt his session. He's a soldier of the Lord. But this Mohammedan who was barking like his prophet left me no choice. And then later on, I'll be having Robert Spencer go to my YouTube channel, hit the notification bell. He will be discussing his book, The Critical Quran. But let me now invite this Mohammedan, this filth. And guys, there goes my link to my stream yard when you want to come on. When you want to come on and ask me questions on any topic. Hold on a second. I don't know what he's watching. Okay. Hold on. Let me send this guy the link. I had blocked him because he wouldn't stop barking. So now let me send him the link. Hold on. Let's see if he's going to show up. If he's more man than Aisha was. And we got a lot to talk about. So be prayed up. Do not chew the fat and socialize. This is a class. Let the Holy Spirit teach and focus on the Spirit, all of us, in Jesus' name. Glory to the Father, Son, Son, Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Son. Glory to the Holy Spirit. In the name of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wash me, God and Savior, King, Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Spirit. And now here's what's terrible. I think I forgot the man's name. Hold on. No, I don't think so. Let's see. Oh, yep, here he goes. All right, so let's see. Let's call this guy. We are live, Mohammedan Stone Kisser. We're all live. Awais, KD Muslim. Oh, he's in the comment section. You guys blocked him. Hey, KD Muslim, Stone Liquor, come join us so I can destroy your prophet for the glory of Jesus Christ. He's actually in the, I just noticed he's there. Okay. Come on, come on in. Don't hide like Aisha hid when she was playing with her dolls. You guys actually blocked him. I just saw because his name is Oasis. Oasis. So let's see if he's on. You guys blocked him. Hey, KD Muslim, Oasis. Don't bark like Muhammad acting like a man in Skype. Here's the link, stone kisser. Come on, defend your filthy prophet, the son of the devil. As the Lord Jesus enables me to muzzle you like he muzzled your prophet who's in hell. Come on, KD Muslim. Don't hug like Aisha did, you coward. Yep. No, actually, the Shia are your daddy. Come here. Didn't your mother do muta with the Shia? Stop barking. I'm going to humiliate Muhammad. Stop barking like your prophet. I'm going to have to bring the Shia to tell you which of the 60 Shia fathered you doing muta. Don't be upset. Your prophet allowed. Women like your mother to be prostituted, treated as horse. He called it Zoj and Muta. Let's talk about it, kid. Stop barking. You got the link to StreamYard. Come out. Don't hide like Aisha with her dolls. See, another filthy dog. Barking like a dog and Skype. But now that we're live, a waste, KD Muslim. You don't have the guts to defend your prophet. And I don't blame you. If I was a Muslim, I'd be too scared to defend the son of Satan, Muhammad, who's under the feet of Jesus Christ. Because he was a spiritual dog. May God save you from Muhammad. Anyway, with that said, until this man 
Or this little girl calls and defends Islam and stops acting like Aisha when she ran and hid. When Muhammad mounted her, he's got my stream yard. It's pinned. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Now, that said, there are some things I need to address and talk about. So pray and stay focused. Don't engage the trolls. They know the link. They can join me on StreamYard. Lord willing, a little later, I'll be joined by Robert Spencer. And I'm going to interview him about his critical Quran. Here it is. Just to prepare you, hit the notification bell. Join, and you can ask questions of Robert Spencer as well. Here it is. This is it. The Critical Quran. Okay? Robert Spencer. You see it? Critical Quran. Explain from key Islamic commentaries and contemporary historical research. Now, the brother was kind enough to send me a complimentary copy. Uh, uh, copy. He was kind enough to send me a complimentary copy copy to review. Now, because I've been too busy, I haven't been able to peruse it thoroughly, but I will be asking him questions about why he decided to come up with a Quran with his commentary. With his commentary, see? So, Lord willing, he'll be on a little later. Don't miss that. Robert Spencer, in my opinion, and I'm not just saying it to say it, this would also be the opinion of, let's say, David Wood. Those who know, in the English-speaking world, in my opinion, Robert Spencer is one of the foremost, one of the most knowledgeable experts, scholars on jihad. His knowledge of jihad, his knowledge of the history of jihad, his knowledge of the Crusades is second to none. God has really blessed him and gifted him with a super sharp mind. He has done his homework. So pray God preserve him, fill him with the spirit, and continue to use him to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and expose the true face of Islam. In fact, some people would say, and I'm just saying what people say, they would say that I'm perhaps the most knowledgeable they met. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to be humble. You know, I struggle with pride. May God destroy my pride. I am not the most knowledgeable apologist out there. <clears throat> I have key areas where God has blessed me by the spirit to excel, but... I am not as scholarly as some people think, and I'm not looking to be viewed as a scholar. May God destroy my pride, my arrogance, purify my motives, that I do it for the glory of Jesus, not because I want accolades. May God save me from my own <clears throat> weaknesses and pride, that I never fall into that snare, to be sanctified to do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. When it comes to jihad and the history of jihad and the wars and the crusades. I am a neophyte. I'm an amateur. Robert Spencer is in my estimation from all those in the English speaking <clears throat> worlds whom God has called to expose Islam and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. In my estimation, he's the most knowledgeable in that area, right? I'm talking about English speaking, speaking apologists, authors, writers, and scholars. Now, he is able to work with the Arabic text because he has access to scholarly resources and to Arab speakers. But as far as I know, as far as I know, I'm going to ask him that later. May God save me from error to speak clearly and present facts accurately. He doesn't read Arabic or write Arabic, and he doesn't speak Arabic, but I'm going to ask him that. So for all the non-Arabic speaking scholars, writers, apologists dealing with Islam, in my estimation, when it comes to jihad, the <clears throat> history of jihad, how the Muslims expanded the rule of Islam through offensive jihad and the Crusades, he is the most knowledgeable. There's another gentleman who is amazingly knowledgeable when it comes to the Crusades. He's up there. He's in probably the top 10, if not top five. His knowledge of the Crusades and why the Crusades were embarked is second to none. He's amazing. And it's Alan Ruhul. He's one of my mods. I've interviewed him on my channel, Alan Ruhul, and he has his own YouTube channel and blog. And ironically, I was introduced to him 
when James White went after him on one of his DL shows. So thank you, James White. Had it not been for your interaction with Alan Ruhl, I would not have known this man and befriended him. He is an encyclopedia when it comes to the history of the Catholic Church and the Crusades. He's amazing. So if you guys are looking for someone who is an expert and specializes in the history of the Crusades, Alan Ruhl is your guy. He's one of my mods. He has his YouTube channel. Go there and subscribe. Support the brother and pray for him and encourage him and love him for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and invite him to speak. Yeah, that's true. This is true. Meaning David Wood said this. David Wood is on record. He said it publicly on many occasions. He said it behind my back and in front of my face. And he said it live on his streams. David Wood believes Sam Shimon is the greatest apologist against Islam in history. He says, in the past 1,400 years, he, could, he considers me the greatest. And I love that big dummy. May God soften his heart towards me. He's my partner to the Lord Jesus calls us home. As long as my brother does not attack the ancient churches, the Coptic, Orthodox, Syrian, Catholic churches, he is my brother and I have his back by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean that. We may get angry and criticize, but he's my brother. And I, I know him. He's got a heart of gold. And his wife, Marie Wood, is a Proverbs 31 woman. I'm not just saying it to say it. Before God, I say this with all sincerity. God blessed him with a Proverbs 31 wife, a godly woman in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, passionate and bold for Jesus, who's taking care of six lions. She has six boys that she takes care of. David Wood and her five sons, two of which have special needs. Pray for her. God will flutter in his love, join peace and preserve her. And God provide for their financial needs. Because without Marie Wood, I don't think David Wood could do what he does. He has been blessed. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. She is truly the crown of her husband who makes her sons walk in the marketplace with their heads high because she has honored them and has done nothing dishonorable. May all women be like that for the glory of Jesus Christ. So, so that's what he says. Now, I laugh at that because... Come on, guys. It's not about who's greater than who. But again, we give a person his or her due. Proverbs 27 verse 2 says, Let another man praise you and not yourself. Proverbs 27 verse 2 says, Let another man praise you and not yourself. So let others praise you. Don't praise yourself. Right? And it's not about your self-praise. It's about glorifying Jesus Christ. So come later and listen to Robert Spencer. Now, with that said, I'm going to share some links. I'm going to answer some questions, and I'm open up to Q&A. I decided to go ahead and post the appendices, right? An appendix, you know what it is. That's, we're not talking about your physical appendix. Appendix, appendices that you find at the end of an article or a book. Like, for example, this Quran may have what's known as an appendix or appendices, more than one. Let me let you in on a little secret that I had mentioned years ago. Okay, are you guys ready for this? Class has begun. Let's focus. Okay. Class has begun. Let's focus. So here it is. Click on that article. I'm not able to share my screen so you can see the visual aid. But here, click on that article. I just posted it, the Sirah and Ahadith, the foundation of the Quran. I just posted it earlier this morning. And then also here's another one. Let me now show you the link on the screen. One second. Get ready. I'm going to let you in on a secret that I mentioned less than a year earlier, but I'm going to repeat because I think I'm going to go ahead and make them public. I think I'm going to start now uploading them to my blog. Let me show you the other article. That was the first one. The second one. Let me get there so you can see. I got to scroll down. And then I'll explain the history behind this project without getting into too many details. The second appendix of these multiple appendices that I wrote is also online, even though I posted this first. Here's the second one. The meaning and purpose of paying jizya. 
the meaning and purpose in paying jizya. Here it is. Here's a link. Okay, click on it, guys. Go see the articles. There it is. What's up, Victor Cocho? What's up, my brother? If you guys don't know, Victor Cocho is a fellow Assyrian, slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, married to one of my cousins, right? Her grandfather on her mother's side was my dad's first cousin. So we got family, familia here. What's up, S.A.? And Victor, don't give out your location. But don't forget this week, Assyrian conventions, baby. Hope to see you there. Right there. That's my guy right here. That's my dude. Say hi to everyone hey, and tell them, huh? They can call me. You know what I'm saying? I'm all alone, Victor. You got a godly family, beautiful wife, beautiful children. God bless you all. You got in-laws and relatives. You got even dogs. And I got me and my cat. I'm here alone, sir. You know, cut me some slack, homie. All right. Love you, man. Haters. All right. Anyway. Here's the article again. Here's the article. Let me mention it. The meaning and purpose in paying the jizya. The meaning and purpose in paying the jizya. Oh, no more dogs? I'm sorry. All right. Well, that means you have more room for me now in your heart. Now that you don't have a dog, you have more room for me in your heart, sir. Okay, so save the link. Now, let me give you a little history. I was going through my email, and I saw an email as far back as 2012. Now, I don't remember the exact year that we embarked on this project. I can't mention names because I don't want the brother Gebset think I'm attacking him. I'm not. I'm going to state the facts as accurately as possible. But I was checking the email to see how far back did this project begin? When did we embark on this project? So when I did a search, because I would send these as Word documents to the gentleman who was overseeing the project so that he would edit them because... We were planning to produce, planning to produce a Christian apologetic commentary on the Quran. Right here, I see an email from September 27, 2012. So, as far back as 2012, I was asked with someone else, I don't want to give too many details, because the gentleman that oversaw this project, we had a fallout over this project. He and I had a fallout over this project. And even since then, we haven't been on the best of terms. He still holds a grudge for his failure, for his dropping the ball. So are you guys ready for me to let you in on a little secret that's not really a secret because I mentioned about a year ago? Who's ready? Because class has begun. We're going to talk about issues and open up Q&A. And the reason why I decided to start uploading them, to make it available for the masses for free to coincide with my interview with Robert Spencer on his <clears throat> The Critical Quran. I was asked to embark on a project where we would write a commentary from a Christian perspective on the entire Quran. And the Quran we use was the Edwin Palmer version. Why? Because Certain books, after 100 years, become free domain, meaning the copyright runs out. For example, let's say this was copyrighted in 1910. Now it's 2022. That means the copyright has expired. It's now public domain. You can take it. You can copy it. You can publish it because there's no more copyright. Well, Edwin Palmer was a Christian who wrote a commentary on the Quran. Okay? Wrote a commentary on the Quran. So listen and follow with me. And the copyright on his Quran translation, it's expired. So it's now public domain, free domain. You can use it. So we decided to take the Palmer Quran and write a commentary on the chapters of the Quran from a Christian perspective. I embarked on that project, as my email shows me, around 2012. Now, due to circumstances, I became the only one working on the project. 
The other gentleman that was involved dropped out. So the burden fell on me, even though I was hesitant. I didn't want to do the project. I didn't want to do it because I didn't think we were qualified to do so. Just like I don't want a, want a Muslim to write a commentary in the Bible because he or she is not qualified to tell me what the scriptures mean. mean. I didn't want to write one. But nonetheless, they pressured me to do so. And I did it from a Christian perspective to weaponize Christians by providing a Quran with a Christian commentary that they could carry with them as they evangelize and do spiritual battle. So I embarked on this project. And I think it took me about a year to finish it. Not only did I finish the commentary on the surahs, commenting, commenting on those passages that I thought were relevant for evangelism. Now, it wasn't a comprehensive commentary on every verse. I went through each surah, and I decided to provide a commentary from a Christian perspective on those verses that I believe were most relevant in Christian witness to Muslims so that Christians would be able to turn to those passages and have a ready defense. Not only did I finish it, I wrote over, if I recall correctly, and I trust the Holy Spirit by his power to enable me to recall the facts correctly, over 20 appendices to go with this Quran commentary, two of which I just uploaded. Those two links, those are two of the over 20 appendices that I wrote that was going to be part of the Quran that we were going to publish for Christian ministers and evangelists so they would have everything they need in one volume or at least two because it was getting pretty big. So I finished it and the brother gave me what they call a stipend, let's say, lack of a better term, where I got paid a certain amount every month. I believe it was around $1,000, maybe $1,200. I don't remember. It wasn't much because... He's a fledgling ministry, right? Couldn't make much money. But I got paid to do it, and I finished it. I sent it to the brother, and he tried to get people to edit it. He got one Christian, who I think was a retired teacher, who went through the entire Quran to check for grammatical mistakes, to edit them and correct them. When he was done, I was told, I was told, by the gentleman who commissioned me to do the Quran project, that the man who edited it, after he read it, he said, after reading this Quran project, I feel I am so knowledgeable and now so confident, I feel like a scholar. That was the gist. Reading this commentary provided me with information that I now have the confidence to go and engage Muslims. That's what the gentleman who commissioned me to do the project said. The teacher told him when he went through it to try to edit it. Now, again, I'm giving you the gist because this was years ago. So that was the first phase. Then he tried to raise up money to get a group of brothers in the Lord Jesus Christ in another continent to thoroughly work through editing it. And he kept delaying it. And he kept delaying it until finally I lost my patience. I called him out saying, when will this be published? And then I went to one of his donors, one of the brothers that supported his ministry, and gave to the project and said, you need to hold him accountable. It's been years, and he hasn't gotten it done. It hasn't seen the light of day. When I did that, I contacted one of the donors, who was a friend of mine and his, and he called him out for it. The gentleman that commissioned me to do the project got upset with me, stopped talking to me, and pretty much buried the project. The project now lies buried. It has yet to see the light of day. And I've met this man ever since. And you can still he, see he still has a grudge in his heart for me holding him accountable for getting it done. And from what I see, he has no intention to get it published because of the bitterness between us. And I have forgiven him, but I am upset with him. And I pray God softens his heart to repent because we rob the people. Not only did we collect money for me to do the project, but the people were waiting for this project. And ever since then, it would have been the first Quran translation and commentary by a Christian, yours truly. But since then, two other commentaries have come out by two different Christians. One by Robert Spencer and another one published by Zondervan. 
This would have been the first. But now it's not only not the first, it may never get published. So there you go. So I now decided I'm going to start uploading the appendices at the very least to my blog free of charge. Free of charge. I'm not making money off of this, but I want to make this available. Here's one of the appendices. There it is right there. Now, I'm going to try to figure out a way where I can then upload the surahs because some surahs are very long. They won't all fit in one post, so I have to break them down. So here it is. Here's one of the appendices. The meaning and purpose in paying the jizya. That's one. The other one, Julie, why don't you stop being a spiritual whore of Anthony? I will destroy Anthony and bury him. Tell a fat boy, your God, to debate me. I'll destroy him. But Julie, don't be a spiritual whore of Jezebel. Can you come and defend your doctrine? But we know you can't because you're a spiritual whore. You're a Jezebel, a daughter of Satan, you filth. See, this is what Anthony and James White attracts. Stalkers, cultists, spiritual whores and dogs who worship men, not Jesus, you filthy whore. Spiritual whore. So when I call you whore, I mean spiritually. Okay? You spiritual whore. Okay, so I hope now you're happy. Now, with that said, coming back to the issue, I will try in due course to upload upload those surahs, but I'm going to try to find a way where I can <clears throat> break them down because I cannot upload an entire surah <clears throat> For many of them, because they're too long. The shorter ones, they'll fit. But the longer ones, so I'm going to have to figure out a way through your prayers. So pray for me. Uh, by the way, FYI, I will bury and destroy Anthony in the debate. He's a clown. He's not on my level. And no boasting. My boast is the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. He's a dog, and we're going to muzzle him until he repents. If he repents, we'll forgive him. Uh, Nicholas, you're a whore too. Hey, Nicholas, you're a whore. Here, let me say, you don't like it? You are a spiritual whore, and Julie's a spiritual whore. You guys are spiritual whores. I'm not here to be politically correct, and I'm not here to tickle your ears. Nicholas, you are a spiritual whore, a prostitute, and I'm using a biblical term. Don't be upset. Don't pretend to be a pious Christian. You're not. You're a fake. You can't be more pious and spiritual and holy than the men of God filled with the Spirit, and they use such harsh language. Don't think you're more spiritual than Paul or the prophets because if you think you're being spiritual because you don't you, you use harsh language, then that means you think you're more spiritual and better than the spirit-filled prophets, apostles, and authors of Scripture, which means you're deceived and you are a spiritual whore. Glory to the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. They don't know me too well, do they? Anyway, yeah, these guys think. That their opinion to me, about me matters. No, guys, it doesn't. As long as Holy Spirit reigns me in, not Anthony, fat boy, Rogers, and constrains me and convicts me and doesn't hand me over to judgment, may he be magnified, glorified, and increase in me. Don't tell me you're being spiritual when you condemn the use of language for dogs who come here like Julie Morano. What purpose? What did she have for coming here to try to instigate and cause a fight? Unless she's a spiritual whore, a Jezebel, a daughter of Satan. So they'll attack me for muzzling a spiritual whore, a Jezebel, who comes in the comment section for no other reason but to say, hey, don't be a coward. Debate Anthony. I'll bury Anthony. He's not on my level. See, like here. You see this whore? So people can see it. Hold on. See, there you go. Now tell me, tell me. Why this whore would come here and talk about me being afraid of Anthony when Anthony knows I'll destroy him. He knows it. The coward knows I'll decimate him. He knows it. He can act tough behind the screen. He knows he's not on my level. I'm not boasting. May God destroy my pride. But what does it say about this spiritual whore, this Jezebel, who comes in here? We're having a discussion. She wants to talk about her lover, Anthony, her God, her idol, whom I'm destroying like I just muzzled this spiritual whore. But they won't condemn these spiritual dogs for causing division 
and causing people to stumble, but they'll attack the person who's muzzling these whores and these dogs for not being Christ-like. The hypocrisy. Yeah. Anyway. Who's this? Yeah, she won't. Mango. Now, for the rest of you, focus in the name of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. Pray for me to God sustain me. I never fall into any scandal or dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ and not to be politically correct. But focus, guys. See, this is what the spiritual whore, this Jezebel wanted to do. Distract. That's what these cult followers do. That's how they are. They love and worship their idols, their cult leaders, and they come distract because they cannot, they cannot. Uh, Nicholas, I swear to you, I'll say it to your face and you won't do a damn thing about it. In fact, here, Nicholas, you are a whore and you're not a man. Call me on Skype. Give me your location. Okay. I swear to you in front of your face and your family's face, I give you my word. Contact me on Skype. Give me your location because you're trying to threaten me. We'll see who the man is. And you are a spiritual whore, Nicholas. You're a filth. Contact me. In fact, here, come on StreamYard. Go to the private. Give me your number and your location. I'm calling out. I will say it to your face. You are a spiritual whore. You're not a man. Let's see. Now call my bluff. Please call my bluff to see if I'm lying. Say another whore. Guys, anyway, I hope you, you can endure. In Jesus' name, may the Lord Jesus increase and constrain us for his glory. Nicholas, I'm calling your bluff out. Give me your location if you think I won't say it to your face if you're a man. Let's see what you're going to do about it. Come on. Do something. Calling out your bluff. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, coming back to the issue. You see when I talked about the project, the demons started manifesting? Nicholas, you're not a man if you don't give me your location and your number. You're not a man. See, I'm showing my face unlike you. I'm calling your bluff. I swear to you in your face and in front of your family. Let's do it. May God be magnified and may the Lord Jesus increase and may the Lord save me from stumbling. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Come on, Nicholas. Don't be a Muhammad and act tough in the comment section. Now, coming back to the issue. Yep, you did. Nicholas, shut your mouth. Stop commenting. Either give me your location or get out of here. Don't be of the devil. I love you enough to say you are a spiritual whore and you won't give me your location. So I can say it to your face and see what you're going to do about it. All right. Anyway. Contact me on Skype. Let's see what you're going to do to me. You filth. Coward. There are only men in the comments section. None of them have the guts to show their face and put their lives on the line and call out Muslims because they don't have the guts to challenge Islam because they know they're little girls because they're afraid the Muslims will behead them or kill them. And they want to act like men in the comment section against Christians. You filth. Anyway, glory to the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Now, for those of you, sorry guys, you know this is not a typical live stream. I have to deal with fake impious Christians who think they're pious, who think they're spiritual, who think they're humble, and they think they're Christ-like, and sit in judgment on others who don't do Christianity the way they do. And you see that Anthony and James White, the kind of sick people they attract, they don't attract healthy Christians. They attract cult followers, cultists, who want to elevate men and worship men instead of Jesus. They are cult <clears throat> Followers, cult mentality. Look at it. Anyway, glory to the Father, Son, Spirit. My name. Now, with that said, coming back to the issue of the Quran projects, because there's other things I want to talk about. Now, this channel may not be for everyone. I'm too harsh. Forgive me if I'm too harsh for your taste, but God bless you. Find another channel. Find another minister whom God will speak to you through him. My style may not be for you. Well, Elias, can you come and join me on my stream so we can talk about whether Muslims behead or not? Okay. Now, Surah, I'm going to learn to ignore you. Calm down, Surah. Sometimes I need to muzzle people and put them in their place. Yep. So anyway, don't forget the point. The man, because of some bitterness in his heart, decided to forego the Quran project. The Quran project will not see the light of day as long as this man has the bitterness in his heart. May God soften his heart and convict him to repent. So now it's been too long. It's been since 2012. It's been since 2012. 
Okay. It's now 2022. I think I'm going to go ahead and start uploading the surahs on my blog, making it available free of charge. So you can then print them out and use them in your witness. Okay. Lord willing. But some of the surahs are too long to fit one post. So I have to break them down. So pray for that. I'll start with the appendices. I'll start with the appendices. In fact, one thing the brother did a long time ago, because he tried to threaten me as well. I told him that I was going to simply upload them to my channel, and he threatened to sue me. I go, I dare you to sue me. Please take me to court. Violate 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 to 8, proving you're not following Scripture because I'm not selling it. I'm not making money off of it. I am simply trying to upload it so people can have access to it. Am I at fault? I spent over a year in difficult circumstances to finish this commentary. I did my part. He dropped the ball. It wasn't finished. And so I have all these surahs where you have commentary on particular verses relevant for evangelism to Muslims from a Christian apologetic perspective that hasn't seen the light of day. And since then, two Quran commentaries have come out, one by Robert Spencer and the other by Gordon and I think he pronounces his name Nichols. Let me see. And the one by Gordon Nichols, published by Zondervan. Nichol, send me your location and see if you're a man, if I won't say to your face. You're a spiritual whore. See, now here, put me in my place. Let's see what you're going to do about it. Let's see. Yep, it's Gordon D. Nichol. Gordon D. Nichol. The Quran with Christian Commentary, A Guide to Understanding the Scripture of Islam, published April 28, 2020. Okay. okay, I think we got a Muslim. Don't be smiling, bro. I'll block you. You're not that good looking to be smiling. All right. Anyway, you won't be able to. I can't share the link. It's too long. But go on. Okay, God bless you, Scott. Go on Amazon.com. Type in. The following, the Quran with Christian commentary, a guide to understanding the scripture of Islam. Oh, wait, is that the finger that the Shia put in your mother's ass? Dawood? Wait, wait, hey, hold on. Do that again? Oh, we got you. Is that the finger that the Shia put in your mother's ass? It yes. is more <laughs> He's giving me a finger. He thought, he we got you now. You're on screen. Toothless. Can we pay for your dental work? Obviously, the mullah isn't paying <clears throat> muta to your mother to get your teeth fixed. Can I start a GoFundMe page for you, Dawood? So we can do something with your teeth? Here it is, guys. There you go. This is it. The Quran. What's up, Carla? Okay, girl. Don't be talking crazy. The Quran with Christian commentary, a guide to understanding the scripture of Islam. This is it. Published April 2020. April 28, 2020. Okay. April 28, 2020. Okay. Gordon Nickel, published by Zondervan. Since I finished the project, guys, two commentaries on the Quran have already seen the light of day, have come out, written by two Christians, Robert Spencer and Gordon Nickel. Had the brother not dropped the ball, our Quran project would have been the first commentary on the Quran, published from a Christian perspective, commenting on all the relevant verses for Christians to use in ministry to Muslims, but that project has become defunct. There you go. See, there you go. So just wanted to share that. And I decided to go ahead because when I reached out to Robert Spencer and asked him, would he come today, <clears throat> come today and talk about his commentary in the Quran? He said, yes. So I decided to go through my emails to find the surahs and dependencies that I sent for the project. And I said, you know what? It's time for me. It's time for me to upload them. 
So now this may get me some backlash because if the brother finds out, he may not be happy about it. But number one, I'm not selling it. I'm uploading them free of charge. I'm not planning to make any money. I'm not charging you. Number two, he did a disservice to the Christians and to the donors by burying the project out of bitterness because I called them to account to get the process rolling. So may God have mercy on all of us. Now, that was the first issue. Let me answer this question that I was asked regarding how many thrones in heaven. Are we ready? Are you guys ready? And then we'll open up the Q&A. Pray for me, guys. Holy Spirit, constrain me not to be politically correct, not to be a crowd pleaser, and not to be unnecessarily offensive, but I cannot stand inconsistent hypocrites that when dogs, spiritual prostitutes, spiritual whores, spiritual bastards, spiritual dogs show up, attack and mock and ridicule and slander, and then I muzzle them, I get attacked for muzzling dogs, use of the devil, pretending to be Christians. Okay? So now, focus, guys. Are you ready to focus? Do not let the trolls distract you, because now I want to answer some questions. I was asked a question that I think it's relevant. John Hosman, love you too, brother. I have people commenting on my Facebook live stream. So I'm rarely watching the comments, but I see another brother commenting. John Hosman, love you, brother. Love your family. Lord Jesus bless you all. All right. Now, let's talk about this question. Let me first set it up. In Daniel 7, 9 to 10. And Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. And Daniel 7, verse 13 to 14. Daniel, in a vision by the Spirit, sees thrones more than one. And he sees two occupants of the thrones. The Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. So there he sees two thrones. And yet, in Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3, God and the Lamb sit on one throne. How do we explain this? So let me explain that, and we're going to open it up. Okay. Hey, Nicole H., don't hide. Send me your information on Skype. Here you go. Be a man. Let's see if you're going to back up what you said, that if I was standing in front of you, I wouldn't say it. I'm calling out your bluff. I'm not going to let you get away with it. Benny underscore Malik 3, send me your location, coward, because I know you won't do it here publicly. And don't worry, I won't give away your identity because you're too much of a coward to show your face because you're afraid of the Muslims coming and beheading you. Coward. Anyway, let's deal with this. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Focus, guys. Class has begun. Help me to help you now. Hey, you know I'm going to have to block you for that, right? Uh, you don't say glory to Sam Shamoon. Delete your comment, Lazar. No glory to Sam. Don't you idolize me. I'm going to block you for that, all right? Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit alone, not to Sam Shamoon. Don't be like the cult followers of Anthony Rogers and James White. Please, delete your comment. I want to block you. Here you go. Daniel 7, 9 to 10. You ready? Let's read. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Okay. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Now watch. Its wheels, a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So let's read carefully by the power of the Spirit. Guys, focus, please. You don't need to be here, but you're here because you want the Spirit to minister to us. So may the Spirit take over and speak through me to bless you. Read the text carefully. Here it is, Daniel 7, 9 to 10. I watched till thrones, plural, more than one, were set in place. 
And the Ancient of Days was seated. So there's one figure called the Ancient of Days, meaning he is very old, very ancient, and he was seated. His garment, so he's appearing in visible shape, in visible form with a visible body. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. So he appears in a visible shape with a visible body, with a visible head, right? And his hair is white. And his garment is white. Now, how many thrones does he sit on, guys? Focus. His throne, singular. You caught it? His throne, singular. But wait, Daniel said he saw thrones more than one. But the Ancient of Days occupied only one throne. So there's another throne for someone else. His throne was a fiery flame. It's, it's not there, it, that one throne. Its wheels, right? Its wheels of burning fire. Okay. Are you paying attention? Let's see if you're paying attention. I can move on to the next point. Daniel sees thrones more than one. He sees a figure appearing in visible form, in visible shape, with white hair and a white robe, and he's seated on one throne. That means there's another throne for someone else. So far with me? This was Daniel 7, 9, and 10. You guys with me so far? Please, guys. This is your class. Okay. Then, then if he saw more than one throne, thrones, and the Ancient of Days occupies only one, then who is the other figure that occupies that other throne? Because he says, I thought thrones more than one. So there's another throne for someone else. Well, you don't need to guess. Here it is. Same book of Daniel. By the Holy Spirit, he sees a vision. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Here it goes. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, meaning he appears as a man. He has a human appearance. A human shape, he appears as a man, but he's more than that. He's like the Son of Man, meaning though he's a man, he's more than that. He's not just human, he's more than that, because he does things that no mere human can do. Only someone who's truly divine can do, such as ride the clouds and sit in throne forever and ever, and all nations worshiping him. You know, Solomon, I'm going to piss on you right now, right? I'm going to piss on you and your prophet because you're a filthy dog. You can't be pa patient. That's what I thought. All right. We got some filthy dog in the background named Solomon. Tsunami barking like a dog. He can't be patient. Another fake Muhammad. I think it's <clears throat> what's his name? Ultimate Muta, son of Muta. Anyway, and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days. He came to the Ancient of Days. So notice there are two figures. The Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is not the Son of Man because the Son of Man is approaching the Ancient of Days. The Son of Man is flying on the clouds of heaven and he's approaching the Ancient of Days. So count, that's two figures, right? Please listen because you see Satan is upset. His dogs are barking, trying to distract. But in the almighty name of Jesus, may he constrain us and not shame him, but glorify the divine Son of Man, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? He came to the Ancient of Days, and they, those in heaven, brought him, the Son of Man, before the Ancient of Days. Now notice the Son of Man is given a kingdom. Watch. Then to him was given, to him was given, dominion. That's kingdom. Glory and a kingdom. That all peoples, not some, all peoples, nations, and all languages, that's all the Muslims and all the languages, including the Arabic, should serve him. Serve who? They're going to serve, worship the Son of Man. And this Son of Man, this Son of Man will reign forever and ever because he possesses an indestructible kingdom. Watch. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. 
Okay, now, just to make sure you're paying attention, not being distracted by the devil, may God cleanse our sessions, purify these sessions in us and the Holy Fire of the Holy Spirit and cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ from all distractions so we can focus because Satan hates this channel. I don't know of any channel that gets attacked as much as I do because Satan knows what our weaknesses are. May the Lord rebuke Satan and constrain us in Jesus' name. Now, Daniel saw more than one throne. thrones. Why more than one throne? Because if you were paying attention by the power of the Holy Spirit, Daniel 7, 9 and 10, and 13 and 14, there are two divine figures. The Ancient of Days, who appears with a head that has white hair and a white robe, seated on one throne, and the Son of Man, who approaches the Ancient of Days, and sits enthroned over a kingdom. Well, if you have a kingdom, then you have to have a throne. So now let me ask you a question, see if you got it. Why did Daniel see more than one throne? And how many exactly did he see? Why did he see more than one throne? And how many did he see? From what we just read, please, in Jesus' name, I pray you're paying attention. From what we just read, as the Holy Spirit illuminates us for the glory of Christ. Why did he see more than one throne? And how many thrones did he see? Come on, guys. This is class. I need your feedback. Help me out. Come on. Give me some feedback, guys. Come on. Thank you, Sebastian. You restored my hope in humanity. Why did he see two thrones? Thank you. You guys are restoring my hope in humanity. Sebastian, you're one handsome-looking young brother. Lord Jesus bless you. May you use your looks to glorify Christ. Yep. But why two? Sargon D, you give hope to the Assyrian nation. You restored my hope in my people. He saw two thrones because there were two divine purposes. Now, person, now I know you guys are listening. Glory to the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you because this is your class for you to learn so you can grow and know your faith so then you can present it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And thank you guys for listening. You got it, guys. All right. Ah. So he saw more than one throne because he saw more than one divine figure. How many? He saw two thrones because he saw two divine figures both of whom look human. One looks like an older man, white hair. One looks like a younger man, a young son of man. That's why. So you guys got it. Glory to the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Everything good that comes from us is the work of the Holy Spirit as we yield to the Spirit. Okay, so then here's the problem, though. In Daniel, he saw two thrones and two figures. But here's the problem. In Revelation, there's only one throne. Belonging to two figures. So I was asked this question. So I'm answering it right now. In Revelation, John sees one throne that belongs to two figures, God and the Lamb. But only one throne. Only one. So how do we explain this discrepancy? Very easy. But let me give you the verses. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. And thank our sister Miriam. She's posting. God bless you, sister. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Beautiful, Philip, you sexy beast, you. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Now, Parumal, your heavenly father, he's not the only one who's Jehovah. Your heavenly father, his name is Jehovah, the son's name is Jehovah, and the Holy Spirit's name is Jehovah. So I hope you're not an anti-Trinitarian. Okay. So here you go. Watch here. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Look how many thrones John sees. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. A pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal proceeding from the throne. Notice it's singular. One throne of God and of the Lamb. Uh-oh. It's now one throne, but this throne belongs to two. God and the Lamb occupy one and the same throne. One throne belonging to God and the Lamb. Two occupants of one throne, not thrones. Okay, in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, 
which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne, notice singular again, singular, throne, not thrones, of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. May the Holy Spirit strengthen my throat and my voice for the glory of Christ. Did you catch it? In Revelation, it's one throne. See, ah, he asked me the question. See, this was the question I was being asked. Okay. He's, this is the question I was asked. I, lo I love your icon, by the way. Can you send me that icon? Uh, Brother Christus, omnipotent, send me that image, that picture. Send me that image, that picture to my Facebook. Not Facebook, my Skype, because I want to download it as an image. Okay, so what's going on here? In Daniel, there are two thrones because there are two distinct persons. Ancient of days who'd be the father, son of man who'd be our Lord Jesus Christ. But in Revelation, it's one throne occupied by two. God and the Lamb together assume and occupy the same throne. Is there a contradiction? No. No, that's not even the answer, soldier of St. Michael. That's not the answer. No, 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 no. Wrong answer, brother. No, sir. Quit your job. Walk by faith, oh, you little faith, and get into ministry full time with me. Okay? So what's the answer? Why? You guys ready for me to unpack this? You guys want me to unpack it? Are we ready now for the answer? And guys, get ready with your questions because I'm open up to Q&A. That's why I decided to do an earlier session before the one with Robert Spencer. Okay, here's the answer. In the Old Testament, during Old Testament history, when it was vitally important to hammer the fact to the Israelites, their God, Jehovah, is one God. And he alone is worthy of their worship and devotion and sacrifice. And they cannot worship, adore, serve, live, or love any other God besides the one true God. It would be vitally important after God hammered that point and they got that point and that point sunk in and it became second nature, right? That he would further display and unveil to the Israelites, by the way, now that you get this point crystal clear in your head, the God of Israel, Jehovah's one, and there aren't multiple gods for you to worship and love and serve and live and die for, let me let you in on this mystery. Your God, the God of Israel, Jehovah, though he's one God, he's more than one person. So Daniel is being inspired by the Spirit to hammer the fact that the one true God that Israel worships and loves and sacrifices and lives for, though he's one God, he's more than one person. So the two thrones would convey the idea to the Israelites, the God of Israel is more than one person. The Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, these two are equal divine persons who reign together over creation. So they're not two separate gods or competing gods. They're two divine persons that make up the identity of the one true God. So that's why the Spirit shows Daniel two thrones to hammer that point. Do we get that? So one second. Let me see if someone's at the door. You understand why in the Old Testament it's two? To hammer the fact and prepare the Israelites for the incarnation. To prepare the Israelites for one of the divine persons appearing as the Son of Man, as a human being, as a youth, right? As a young man, the Son of Man, a human being who would be more than a man, he'd be God in the flesh. So this is preparing them for that revelation. So that when Jesus shows up and calls himself the Son of Man, when Jesus shows up and he says, you shall see me, the Son of Man, riding the clouds of heaven, they would not be shocked 
they would not be offended or scandalized because God already prepared them 500 years earlier through the prophet Daniel that there is a divine figure who will show up who is like the Son of Man. When that Son of Man shows up, know who he is. He's not just a man. He's God in the flesh who reigns forever, and you must worship him. And Jesus shows up, and he claims to be that Son of Man, the one that Daniel saw, the one that Daniel identified as being more than human, but being truly divine, who appears as a man, whom all nations must worship as he rules over them forever. Okay, do we get that part? Is that clear? Before I move on? So then why one throne in Revelation? Why one throne? Just get again, guys, and I'm being honest when I say this. You don't need to be an Einstein or brilliant. All you need to do is seek the face of the Holy Spirit, pray to the Holy Spirit, and ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom to understand his word so you can apply it, live it out, and interpret correctly because that delights the heart of God. Ask wisdom, James 1, 4, right? James 1, 4, if you read actually James 1, read 2, all the way to nine, it talks about the reason why you don't receive because you're double-minded. You're doubtful. You're like <clears throat> the sea that's tossed to and fro by every wind and wave, right? Double-minded. So that's why God doesn't answer you. But if you are stern and firm and you don't waver and doubt and you don't have allegiance to the world and God, but you have undivided allegiance to God, then he will give you wisdom. James 1, 2, all the way to 9. Yep. You with me there? Okay, you got that? I want to make sure. So you don't need to be a genius. You don't need to be an Einstein. All you need to do is seek the face of the Holy Spirit and yield to him and trust him and he'll illuminate you. Now, why one throne? Well, here's why. Are you ready? Let me ask, let me show you why there's one throne. Because now that Jesus has come and he has proven and demonstrated by his miracles and physical bodily resurrection and ascension to heaven, he is that divine son of man. Now what the spirit is doing through John is hammering the point. Now that the son of man has come, now that you know that there's more than one divine person, it's not just the father in heaven, it's the father's son. And the son is not the father. They're not the same person, though they possess the same nature. In order to hammer the fact that now Jesus who comes is not a separate God, a second God, a rival God, though he's a different person, but he's still one with the father. Now the spirit reveals to John that it's only one throne because though the father and the son are distinct persons, their power is one. Their authority is one. Their essence is one. So their throne is one. So in Revelation, the focus is on their unity. That though they're different persons, they're still one. In Daniel, the focus is on, focus is on their distinction. They're not the same divine person. Do we catch why it's different now? So in Daniel... The Spirit moved Daniel to emphasize they are distinct persons. In Revelation, the Spirit moves John to emphasize, though they're not the same person, they're not separate gods. Their power is one. Their authority is one. one. Their kingdom is one. Their rule is one. Their essence is one. Their dominion is one. The Father's rule is the Son's rule is the Spirit's rule. So you have to look at it chronologically. At the time of Daniel, the point needed to be hammered. <clears throat> there's more than one divine person. At the time of John, the point needed to be hammered. Though they're not the same person, they're not separate gods because their nature is one, their essence is one, their rule is one, their authority is one, their dominion is one. So the Father's kingdom is the Son's kingdom is the Spirit's kingdom which they share with us, we who are united to Christ in our spiritual body. So the Father's authority, the Son's authority, is the Spirit's authority that they share in union with us, the body of Christ. Right? 
Let me give you another passage to hammer this point. Ephesians 5, 5. Is it making sense to you guys? Okay. Ephesians 5, 5. Here, let me show it to you. Thank you, Miriam, for posting James 1, 2 to 9 for the context. You see it there. Here it is, Ephesians 5, 5. So hopefully that answered the question. I was out of trouble with a brother trying to explain it to him, and he wasn't getting it. Ephesians 5, 5. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom, singular, of Christ and God. One kingdom possessed of Christ and God. You got it? And someone earlier quoted Revelation 3.21. So let's look at that. Let's look at that. Because the Father's throne is the Son's throne, which is our throne. Which then will segue into the Queen of Heaven again. Because someone brought up an objection. And I challenged him to call me. But you think these guys are going to show up and call? Not at all. Revelation 5.5. Revelation 5.5. Yep, here you go. I'm sorry, Revelation 3.21. Did I say 5.5? 5, 5? So you guys got me thinking of Ephesians 5.5. 5. Sorry. That is Revelation 5.5. 5. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the skull and to loose its seven seals. But it's Revelation 3.21. But I was thinking Revelation 5.5 5 because we just got done quoting Ephesians 5.5. 5. May the Spirit perfect our ability to recall Obey, understand, live out, and love the scriptures for the glory of Jesus Christ. Here it is, courtesy of our sister. Revelation 3, 21. Notice, the Father's throne is the Son's throne, and it's our throne. Here, notice, this is our Lord speaking. Revelation 3, 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Oh, wow. So how many millions, if not billions of believers have overcome and will overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit as they yield to the Spirit, not resist. Countless, too many. In Revelation 7, 9 to 17, we're told. Revelation 7, 9 to 17, we're told there's so many, they can't be numbered. Well, that's got to be one huge throne. This throne must be infinite in length. If every believer is going to sit on the one throne of Christ. Now, obviously, that's not literal, is it? Okay. Uh, June, I don't know what you're talking about in the comment section. Come on my stream yard, and hopefully you'll be able to answer questions and not do the tap dance. Obviously, throne here isn't a, isn't a literal throne, because if it's literal, then this throne's going to have to be infinite in its dimension to fit billions of believers on it. Obviously, throne here is a symbolic reference to authority, dominion, and rulership. So let me paraphrase what Jesus is saying. To him overcomes, I will allow him to share in my authority, in my rule, and my sovereignty over heaven and earth, as I also overcame and share in, possess, the dominion, the rule, the authority, the sovereignty of my Father. So notice the authority is one, the sovereignty is one, the kingdom is one. So throne here is a symbolic reference, not to an actual throne, because think about it. If it's literally a throne, it's going to have to be infinite in its width. Because everyone's going to sit on one throne? No, obviously, this is symbolic language, what we call metaphorical. Throne being a metaphor for kingdom. So Jesus is saying... If you overcome and prove faithful, you will share in my rule. My dominion will be your dominion. My authority will be your authority. You will reign with me and share in my dominion like I overcame and I reign with my father and I share in his rule and I possess his authority. So the father's authority is my authority and your authority. Is that clear? 
So just like the throne is one, but the occupants are more than one, all believers who sit on the throne with Jesus are not the same person. We're all different, distinct persons and beings. God the Father and Jesus the Lamb, though their throne is one, they're not the same person. They're distinct persons, though one God. Clear? Was that clear? So I can answer this objection again. AJ, you disappoint me. I was hoping you'd show up, but you didn't. So let me read his comment. Sent this in the comment section. I don't know how many times I, I need to repeat this point and make it clear. You don't want to accept it. That's between you and the Lord. Stop coming to my comment section and chiming in because that means you're looking for a fight. And I'm inviting you to then join me on my stream and then refute me exegetically. Don't talk over me. Don't evade the issues. Let's discuss. And the reason why I cut people off is because I sense they're running. They're evading the issue. Smoke and mirror tactics. No, let's get to the point. So let's read this comment. You don't want to accept it? That's okay. I had a hard time too. I didn't come to this overnight. Keep it to yourself because when you chime in the comment section, that means you want to engage me and debate me. So I call you out and you still don't show up. So I don't know what to tell you. Right? So hold on, let me read the comment. And then get ready. Come on board, streamer, and ask your questions. If not, we're going to wrap it up and prepare for my stream with Robert Spencer. Okay. Let me find it. Hold on, guys. All righty, then. Let me get it here, guys. One second. And I'll post it for you. Here it is. And he still hasn't called. It's not AJ. Lord, save me from error, misinformation, and save me from sin and perfect us and sanctify us to know the truth, love the truth, live off the truth, and hate sin and love the Lord Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. It's JL2000. These guys with these fake nicks and these fake, what they call them, av avatars, if you want to remain anonymous, that's fine. But don't come and ch chime in and comment anonymously. That's the coward way of doing things. And Nichols, I'm still waiting for your information that you said I wouldn't say in front of your face. I'm calling your bluff. Don't make me wait. Tough guy. Here it is. Look what he says. Call me out. See if I don't say in front of your face. Trying to punk me out. These guys. If I was scared of threats, I wouldn't be showing my face and walking out publicly knowing they're jihadis who would like to stab me or shoot me, kill me, just like they tried to do with Salman Rushdie. You wicked dog trying to punk me out and make me scared. My life is in the hands of Jesus and may he make me bold for his glory. Here's the comment. Little kids. I'm sorry, Sam. You've been an inspiration to me with your teachings, but this is not biblical venerating Mary in this way. It's not biblical, and I can't support this. I hope God open your eyes. God open my eyes, not his. God open my eyes, not his. So JL2000, you haven't been an inspiration to me. You are a stumbling block because you did what cowards do. Take a shot and run. JL2000, come and defend your assertion. If you think you know the Bible, I'm wrong. Put me in my place by the power of the Holy Spirit. God has opened my eyes. Glory to the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, which is why I am not you and I don't believe like you. I was mistaken like you, but he's perfecting me in Jesus' name. May he open your eyes, rebuke your arrogance, soften your heart to come to the fullness of the truth. So, okay, now my question is this. What have I said in the streams about Mary being the queen mother, queen of heaven, being blessed and honored that wasn't biblical? See, he didn't even give me a biblical argument. What exactly did I say that is not biblical? What veneration did I ascribe to the blessed mother that's not biblical when I made a thorough case biblically that this veneration is anchored in scripture and it's an accurate unfolding explication of what the God-breathed scriptures say about the Blessed Mother. That's all you got to say to me? That's it? 
You can't show me where I'm wrong? Give me an example. I don't know who you are, June, that you're saying you spoke this wrong. I have no idea. What are you talking about, June? I was instructed to find a man who would help me. Who instructed you? That person is to be directed by the Holy Spirit. I was spoken to by the mother of Christ. Are you telling me that you had a dream or vision where the Blessed Mother told you to find a man guided by the Spirit? I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I I don't know what this person talking about. Anyway, do you want me to go over real quickly that the honor and respect and love given to the Blessed Mother is biblical. It's not anti-biblical and doesn't go beyond what is written, but it's an accurate explication, unfolding, interpretation, and unpacking of what Scripture teaches. You want me to do it again? One more time? Okay, Queen Mother. Let's go into that. The queen mother concept, here's the article. I did a session on it. And here's my article on it. Let's go through it again. And does this apply to our Lord Jesus Christ? You better believe it does. Because here, I'm going to show you how. You guys ready? We're going to go into meat. Guys, I'm here to serve you. As long as you can put up with me and pray God will protect me from these dogs who come in here to try to make me look bad. So that filthy dogs like Anthony will take clips saying, look. He's out of control. Look, see, he became Catholic. He became Orthodox. He became Coptic. He's out of control. We used to rein him in. Because that's what they want. To discredit me because they can't refute me. Yeah, if June is a distraction, please block June. Send June back to July. <laughs> Send June back to July. Get it? Anyway. Here, let me let me get you the article. Queen Mother. Here it is. Rewatch the sessions, reread the articles. Here it is. Mary as Queen Mother. Mary as Queen M Mother. Yeah, this is this person's a nut. Hey June, we're gonna send you back to July. All right. Here it is. Mary as Queen Mother. Here's the article. Okay. Where do we get the notion? that Mary is the queen mother, is there a biblical basis for it? So are you ready for me and unpack it one more time? You guys ready? Are you listening? Thank the Lord our numbers may increase for the glory of Christ, not for my praise. And I may, may I never change for money or status or to appease people. May I change only for the glory of the Father, the Son, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. All right. Number one, to make it very easy, does the Bible teach does the Bible teach those who are united to Christ, born of the Spirit, reign with him? Yeah, I just read it. Let's go through it again. Ephesians 2.6. Let me line, line, line them up. Ephesians 2.6. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. Ephesians 2.6. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation 5, 9 to 10, and Revelation 3, 21. Let me repeat. Ephesians 2, verse 6. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation 3, 21. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. So here, let's post them. Okay? Let's go. Let's go through this one more time. Ephesians 2, 6. God has raised us up together. We who are born of spirit, made alive, united to Christ. Raised us up together and made us sit. Guys, listen. Made us sit. Right now, when you're united to Christ, born of the Spirit, your union with Christ, positionally, you're already seated in heaven. I'm already seated in heaven because my head, the head of the body, my representative, is sitting on the throne representing me on my behalf. So positionally, I'm seated right now. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.6. Does that apply to the Blessed Mother? Is the Blessed Mother not united to Christ? Isn't Jesus flesh of her flesh, bone of her bones, blood of her blood? Physically his mother and spiritually his mother and spiritually his sister. And a daughter of God, saved by her son, glorified by her son. Doesn't that apply to her? Or only us? Forget her. All right. 
First Peter 2, 9 to 10. First Peter 2, 9 to 10. Watch here. Tell me if this applies to the Blessed Mother. First Peter 2, verses 9 to 10. For only us. I have nothing to do with the Blessed Mother. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Royal priesthood? Your priests that are royal, so you believers are kings and queens who are also priests and priestesses serving God? So does this include Mary? Is she a queen and a priestess who reigns with her son and serves God in heaven? Or is she excluded? A holy nation, his own special people. How much more the Blessed Mother is the special people of God? Because not only is she born in the Spirit, one with Christ, part of the body of Christ, she's the mother of Christ who gave to him his flesh and blood. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Does this apply to the Blessed Mother or everyone but the Blessed Mother? Does it apply to her? Are you serious? We're all kings and queens who are already seated with Christ, who's representing us as our head, seated on heaven in our behalf as a son of man representing glorified humanity that is now glorified, restored, reconciled in union with him. How much more his blessed mother who gave to him his flesh, his bones, his blood to make him truly human, to truly make him the son of man, to be our representative. Okay, I got more. Hold on. Watch here. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, okay? Watch how I'm going to do this again. Another time after just this issue. Like you can't stop addressing the same issues. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him, Jesus our Lord, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So wait, Jesus didn't love his blessed mother? Not only was she his biological mother, but also his creature. Jesus created Mary as his possession and chose her to be his mother. Did he not love his mother both as her creator life giver and savior, and as her biological son? Did he not wash her and purify her from ever being contaminated by sin, which is what I believe? But if you don't believe that, you still believe she was washed? And has made us, watch here, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever, amen. Did he make his mother a queen and a priestess serving his God and Father, or no? And what do priests do? Don't they mediate? Don't they intercede? Don't they pray for the people of God? Well, if the Blessed Mother has been washed by the blood of her son, the blood he took from her holy consecrated womb, if the Blessed Mother is a creature whom Jesus created, because he's her creator and God and Savior and life giver and Lord, and if the Blessed Mother was created by Jesus to give him his humanity, his physical body, through which he redeemed human beings, is Mary not a queen reigning with her son and a priestess serving his God and Father? Yes or no? Answer that for me, guys. What do priests do? Answer that for me. Can someone tell me? What do priests do? Okay, Revelation 5, 9 to 10. Well, Revelation 3, 21. So if Mary is a queen and a priestess, and she's reigning now with her son, what biblical basis do you have for denying she reigns and she intercedes when the job of priests is to pray and intercede? Come on, guys. You want to be biblical, right? I'm giving you Bible. I didn't even give you church history. Revelation 3.21. Revelation 
Okay? I didn't want to accept these doctrines. God knows. For years I opposed them. But because I wanted the truth and accept the truth and affirm the truth and know and live out and love the truth, because our God is the truth, the Spirit convicted me and the Spirit chastened me until I yielded. Okay? Look at here, Revelation 3, 21. Jesus, our Lord speaking, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Did the blessed mother overcome? Did the blessed mother overcome or she failed? Answer me, Protestants, who hate anything that smells Catholic. Did the blessed mother overcome? Thank you. Yes. If she overcame, is she reigning with Jesus on his throne? Is she sharing in the throne of her son? Is she reigning with him? Okay. Is she reigning with him? So if she's reigning with him and she's sharing in his throne, what does that make her? Uh, a queen? Oh. A queen? Let's piss on Muhammad and his Satan Allah who raped him spiritually. That filthy whore Muhammad. Glory to Jesus Christ. This filthy dog making fun of our God. Abu Muhammad, Ali ibn Ahmed, ibn Sayyid, ibn Muta, because his mother was known in Shia for doing Muta. So does that make her a queen? All right. So where am I being unbiblical? Okay, well, hold on. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. I mean, I don't know how many times we must repeat the same teaching. But we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively until it becomes second nature. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Let's do this. Hold on. Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Here you go, guys. One second. Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Okay, Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Here you go. Let's put it there. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. Okay. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now notice verse 10. And have made us what? Kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. All right, wait. Did the Lord Jesus redeem his mother? Yes. Did the blessed mother overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit filling her? Yes. Did the Lord Jesus make her a queen and priestess to serve his God and Father? Yes. Is she one with Christ in the Spirit as well as in the flesh? Yes. Those in Christ, are they seated with Christ positionally? Yes. So does that mean the Blessed Mother is now reigning with her son as queen and priestess, seated on his throne, sharing in his rule, which is what Jesus said he does for all who overcome? Yes. So if she's a queen and a priestess, what do priests do if not serve, pray, intercede, and mediate? What's the problem? But wait, there's another element to this. Jesus is also the heir of David. Jesus is also the heir of David, who sits on the throne of David. Luke 1, 32 to 33. But who made him a son of David? Who made him a physical descendant of David? Because he didn't have a biological father. His blessed mother. His blessed mother. Luke 1, 32, 33. Because his mother, his mother was a physical descendant of David. She gives to Jesus his physical lineage, ancestry, his physical body, his blood, his bones, his flesh. Okay? So Gabriel says to the Blessed Mother, where we get in Latin, Ave Maria. That's Luke 1, 28. Cheir que querito meni. Okay? In Latin, Ave Maria. Cheir que querito meni. 
right? Ave Maria. Here you go. Luke 1, 32, 33. Thank you, Miriam. God bless you, sister. Keep posting. He will be great. Gabriel saying to the Blessed Mother, your son will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Will give him the throne of his father, David. So he is the Davidic descendant, the physical seed of David, the heir to David's throne. Okay, keep that in mind. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom and his kingdom, there will be no end. There will be no end. Eddie, ask me one more time so I can block you, Eddie. One more time. Gratia plena. Que querito mini. Gratia plena. Right? Okay, now, he's the son of David, the heir to David's throne, who sits on David's throne. Dutch. I'm going to block you. You keep asking. Shut up and listen, dude. Stop being a distraction and tool of the devil. Focus to the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, Sa Sajid, I'm going to piss on your prophet Muhammad because Romans 1, 3 to 4 says he is of the seed of David and your own commentators, Ibn Kathir, that dumb stone-looking bastard said, according to chapter 6, verses 83 to 88, Jesus is a son of Abraham from his mother's side. So, Sajid, you're going to make me piss on Muhammad and on your Quran because it shows you're stupid you don't know your Quran. According to your Muslim scholars, exegeting chapter 6 of the Quran, verses 83 to 88, where Jesus is listed as one of the descendants of Abraham, they say the reason why Jesus is a son of Abraham is because of his mother. His mother made him the seed of Abraham, you dumb, stupid Pagan stone liquor. Don't make me piss on your Quran because my urine, urine is cleaner than the Quran. But now you just contradicted yourself, you wicked pagan. You just said, no, he's not the seed of David because, you know, he, he didn't have a father. Oh, but now, oh, yeah, he is through his mother. You dumb pagan stone licker. You see what happens when you follow Muhammad? You become stupid like Muhammad. Shut up and listen, Sajid, before I embarrass you. Learn, repent. You don't need to be stupid. You don't need to be a pagan. You can be a son of God and a king reigning with Jesus Christ if you take Jesus as your Lord and Savior and love him and worship him and join me in spitting on Muhammad. Stupid. They think we don't know the Quran. In chapter 6, verses 83 to 88 of the Quran, it mentions the descendants of Abraham, and one of them is Yahya, John the Baptist, and Isa, Jesus. And then your commentators, like Ibn Kathir, say, this is proof that a man can trace his physical lineage from his mother. Because Jesus had no father, he had a mother, and he was a physical son and seed of Abraham through his mother, you pagan. You think I'm stupid like Muhammad? I don't know your sources. Stupid. Are you guys ready now to move on? Don't you love these sessions? How passionate and animated we get? And we're not politically correct? Pray for me. God preserve me by his almighty power. Give me at least 20 more years of health, honor to do ministry and see my daughters grow up and then take me for the glory of Jesus. Okay, now... Did you hear what Gabriel said to the Blessed Mother? Jesus will inherit the throne of his father, David. And he'll rule, rule over the house of Jacob forever. Don't forget this point. Okay? Here it is, Luke 1, 32, 33. Focus, no distraction, you're going to get blocked. He'll be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. So he inherits the throne of David as the physical son of David from his blessed mother who made him the seed of David. Romans 1.3, as well as 2 Timothy 2.8. Romans 1.3, 2 Timothy 2.8. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. We got it? Is that clear? Did we get that? 
Let me know if we got it so we can move on because see the point. All right. Here's another thing to connect with our Lord. Watch here. Isaiah 22, 15 to 22. Isaiah 22, 15 to 22. Pay attention to this. Okay. Isaiah 22, 15 to 22. Okay, guys, read this. The dynasty of David, the Davidic dynasty, right? Who is in control of the Davidic household, the Davidic dynasty? Okay. Who has the key to the estate of David? Let's read. Isaiah 22, 15 to 22. Watch here, guys. Let's post it and read with me. Go proceed to the steward, steward, to Shebna, who's over the house, and say, what have you here and whom have you here that you have hewn a sepulchre here? As he who used himself a sepulchre, sepulchre on high. Watch here. Who carves a tomb for himself on, in a rock. Indeed, the Lord, Jehovah, Jehovah, will throw you away violently, O mighty man, and will surely seize you. He will surely turn violently and toss you like a ball into a land, a large country. He's going to roll you up like a ball and throw you into a large country. Watch here. There you shall die, and there your glorious chariots shall be the shame of your master's house. Now watch. So I will drive you out, Shebna. I'm going to drive you out, Shebna. I'm going to destroy your household. Drive you away from your office. And I'm going to dispossess you. Remove you from your position, right? He will pull you down. Then it shall be on that day that I will call my servant, Eliakim. Pay attention, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe, Shebna. I'm going to remove you, send you into exile. And then I'm going to place you with Eliakim. He'll be the steward, the master of David's house. And he'll have the key to David's house. Pay attention to the language. You're not listening. You're not learning. You won't get the depth of Scripture, the meat of Scripture. Okay? I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. And what is his responsibility? He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah, the key of the house of David. I will lay on his shoulders. So Eliakim will be the steward the manager of David's household. He'll have the key to David's dynasty. He'll open and shut the doors. He has access to it, and he becomes the father to the Jews spiritually as he oversees the Davidic dynasty. So he shall open, and no one shall shut. Right? He shall open, and no one shall shut. Let me quote the rest of it. Hold on. And she shall shut and no one shall open. Here it is, Isaiah 22, 22. Watch this, guys, because I'm going to tie it in with Jesus, our Lord. Okay? Isaiah 22, 22. Let's see who's paying attention because I got a question. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. Whoever has the key to the household of David manages David's household oversees David's household. He's in charge of David's household and he is entrusted with the care of the people and he becomes a spiritual father, right? This is why when he opens, no one can shut it because he's the only one who can lock or unlock. And when he locks, no one can open. Now watch this. Here's what our Lord says. Revelation 3, 7 and 8. Revelation 3, 7 and 8. Revelation 3, 7 to 8. Guys, listen to this. Revelation 3, 7 to 8. No, you can't, Amir. Revelation 3, 7 to 8. Read with me. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say, says he who is holy, he who is true. Now watch. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts. And shuts and no one opens. He, Jesus, risen in glory, reigning as Lord of Lords and King of Kings from the Father's throne in heaven. He has the key 
to the Davidic dynasty, to the household of David. That's why when he opens, you can't shut it. When he shuts it, you can't open. And look what he goes on to say. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. And no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and I'm not denied my name. Question. Does the Bible teach Jesus has the key to the Davidic dynasty, to the household of David? So he's in charge of David's household and estate. And does the Bible teach Jesus is the physical seed of David and the heir to David's throne who reigns on the throne as David's representative? Answer those questions, please, so we can move on. We got it? All right. Well, hold on. So Jesus has the key. So he now manages, runs David's household. What Eliakim was to David's house and a spiritual father to the people, Jesus is from heaven. He's the steward, the manager of David's household. He inherits all the blessings of David and fulfills them in his own person. He has the key to David's house. He opens, no one can shut. He shuts, no one can open. And he is the physical seed of David through his blessed mother who sits on David's throne forever and ever. Okay, but hold on one second. According to the Bible, the Davidic kings have a queen mother. According to the Bible, the Davidic kings have a queen mother. Here you go. First Kings 15, 13, all from my article. I'm just going to read a few. Also, he removed Macha, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah, and Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron. All right, well, let's see. There's many of them. Let me give you just two more. One in response to Solomon's own mother, who was the wife of David, Bathsheba. Here's this one. 2 Kings 10.13. Jehu met with the brothers of Ahaziah, King of Judah and said, who are you? So they answered, we are the brothers of Isaiah. We have come down to greet the sons of the king and the sons of the queen mother. We've come to greet your brothers, the sons of your mother, who's the queen mother and your children. Okay. What did Solomon do for the Sheba? Hold on. First Kings 2. Let's read, not all of it. Let me read the relevant part. We're going to read 19 to 22. Not all of it, but let me get the part. Hmm. Let me see. Let me let me go there and get it from Bible. Because I quoted from 12 to 22, but I don't want to quote all of it. Here it is. 1 Kings 2, 19 to 22. It's 2, 19 to 20, but we're going to go to 22. Here it is. 1 Kings 2, 19 to 22. Here it is. Let's read it. Here it is. 1 Kings 2, 19 to 22, even though it's verses 9 and 20. Watch here. Watch here. I'll quote 20, 20, 21, 22 in a minute. Here it is. 1 Kings 2, 19 to 22, but particularly 1 Kings 2, 19 to 20. But Sheba, therefore, went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed down to her. Solomon is bowing down to his queen mother. And sat down on his throne and had a throne set for the king's mother. So she sat at his right hand. Then she said, I desire one small petition of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, ask it, my mother, for I will not refuse you. Now let me read 21, 22 and then ask the question. 21 to 22 and ask the question. Okay, get ready. Okay, here you go. These are the things that changed my mind. The Bible. I'm not reading my prejudices into the Bible, but letting the Holy Spirit illuminate me. So he, she said, let Abishak, the Shunammite, be given to Adonijah, your brother, as wife. And King Solomon answered and said to his mother, now why do, why do you ask Abishak, the Shunammite, Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for 
him the kingdom also because he knew Adonijah was setting him up, trying to manipulate him through the love of his mother because he was plotting to usurp the throne because Adonijah felt it was his right to be the king. For he's my older brother, for him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab the son of Zariah. So he's letting his mother know, hey, he's trying to use you and set me up and use you against me. But hold on. Let's look at this one more time. Watch here. One more time. Bathsheba, therefore, went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed down to her and sat down on his throne and had a throne set for the king's mother. So she sat at his right hand. Let me ask you guys a question. Guys, let me ask you a question. You ready? Here's a question. Bathsheba was the immoral, adulterous woman who had sex with David. Even though she was married to Uriah the Hittite, David got her pregnant in that act of adultery. To hide his shame, he had her husband murdered. Then he married her so that everyone would think she gave birth to his son after he married her. God confronted David, rebuked him, chastened him, and shamed him. And the child born as a result of adultery was struck down with plague and died. If an adulterous, sinful woman could be forgiven by God and honored by God to be the queen mother, to give birth to the son who would inherit the throne. And because her son is the king, she's now honored and elevated to the status of queen, queen mother, honored by her king's son, bowing before her feet, a sinful woman, and given a throne to his right hand. How much more do you think the true son of David, the greater David, the physical seed of David, who sits on David's throne and inherits the dynasty of David, who manages the household of David, has a key to David's house. How much more do you think he'll honor his holy and blessed, beautiful mother when it's his mother that gave him his physical body, his flesh, his bone, his blood, and it's his mother who made him human, and made him a seed of David because he had no father. How much more do you think he will honor his blessed mother who made him the son of David and therefore the Davidic king, making her the queen mother? So where am I being unbiblical? Where am I being unbiblical? Did I quote church tradition? No. Did I quote Catholic scholars? No. Did I quote or no? F no. I gave you pure Bible. Why can't you refute me? Why do you have to take cheap shots like JL2000, the coward? Why can't you come and refute me? You say sola scriptura, tota scriptura. I gave you nothing but scripture. Yep. The lesser to the greater. Solomon is a shadow of Christ. Christ is greater, Solomon is lesser. But Sheba is a picture of Mary. She is lesser, Mary is greater, because Mary is immaculate, pure, unstained by the Holy Spirit to give to Jesus an unstained, pure, sinless, physical body, human nature. Why can't you refute me? Why do you have to attack me? Why do you then come to my channel, egg me on, where then I call you biblical names? Refute me. It is biblical to call someone a spiritual whore, prostitute, a dog, a Jezebel, filth, swine, tool of the devil, when they come here to mock, ridicule, slander, bear false witness, and try to divide the brethren. I'm being biblical. Prove me wrong. Yep. Raises up. Where am I wrong? Where am I wrong? Can you tell me where I'm wrong? And these tough guys who think they're men behind their computer screen, you wouldn't say that to my face. I'll say it in front of you and your family. Call my bluff, Nichols. I'm waiting Skype. Here it is in case you missed it, Nichols. Prove me, see if I won't show up to see if you're going to carry out your threat. You filthy Mohammedan pretending to be a Christian. Come on. There you go. And then 
Anthony Dodger, see? We used to rein him in. But now he's just gone off the deep end. Here, take some more clips, you fat slob, fat boy, because that's all you can do. And I'll decimate you in debate, and you know it. Bible pervert. May God have mercy on your pathetic soul. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Seed farmer, let's be careful with your mother because the Shia were not careful with your mother <clears throat> because the Shia went crazy on your mother. <clears throat> so let's be careful with your mother and her nonsense because obviously she wasn't careful and she gave birth to you, a bastard. Your mother is not good enough to lick the sandals of the Blessed Mother, you filth. Trying to say, let's be careful of this very nation of Mary. Yeah, get out of here, you filth. Pretending to be a Christian. Do you hear what he said? Now he's playing, see, like a narcissist. Oh, wow. Let me just disrespect the Blessed Mother. And then when you call me out for it, showing that my mother is not good enough to lick the sandals of the Blessed Mother, and neither is my mother. My mother is not good enough to lick the sandals of the Blessed Mother, even though the Blessed Mother is only a creature created by Jesus, and she is what she is only because of Jesus, no more, no less. But now let's get sensitive, you know, because, you know, yeah, no, very Christ-like of me, you filthy dog, to dishonor the, the blessed mother of Jesus, you filth. Don't appeal to Christianity, you filth. No Christian would denigrate the blessed mother as you did, pretending to be pious. I know you have a problem with your mother, not being venerated. But that sucks being you. See this? You see this filthy dog pretending to be a Christian? See that? Vessel. What's better is I insult you for being filth. Get the hell out of here, you clown. If someone disrespected your mother, I want to see what you'd say. But again, you have no honor. You're okay with people disrespecting your mother because you have no respect for your mother's. I have zeal and respect for the mother of my Lord. So when some filthy dog pretending to be a Christian or has a picture of Jesus on the throne wants to de denigrate the blessed mother, this Mary veneration nonsense, you better believe I'm going to disrespect you. See? See the filth who pretended to be a Christian? And he's got even an avatar of Jesus. You see that, guys? Let's be careful with this Mary veneration nonsense because he has no respect for his own mother because she's not honorable. He thinks he can then talk about the Blessed Mother in this matter. And you guys wonder why I'm the way I am. Right? Filthy scum vessel. Why don't you go play some music for the Shia as they do muta with your mommy? You guys caught it? This guy who has a picture of Jesus supposedly. You see it? Let's be careful with this Mary veneration nonsense. Do you guys really blame me for cussing them out and insulting them for wanting to disrespect the Blessed Mother? How many of you men would allow anyone to disrespect your mother? And yet when people disrespect the mother of all mothers, the Blessed Mother, right? The Blessed Mother, the Queen Mother, the mother who gave Jesus his physical body humanity, through which he saved us, let's call it veneration nonsense, thinking I'm being pious and Christ-like and doing Jesus a favor, and you want me to be silent. And you see why they hate me, and all they can do is try to take clips to say, look, we can't rein him in. Look at the insults. You better believe it, because I'm born in the wrong time. I should have been at the time of Athanasius when St. Nicholas jacked Arius in his face. At least they would appreciate me more than these effeminate, sissified Christians. <laughs> right? Anyway, everyone learn. Was that good? Sorry, guys. That my channel is not going to be for everyone. I am going to be harsh, in your face, not politically correct. If you insult my Lord and you insult the Blessed Mother and you insult his holy apostles and prophets, I'm going to insult you. I'm going to attack you and your family to give you a taste of what it's like to insult the Blessed Mother. You don't like it when I insult your mother, but you want to denigrate the Blessed Mother, thinking you're being pious and doing Jesus a favor as you do so, you filth.
And for the record, none of us are good enough to lick Paul's sandals. Let me repeat. I will never be good enough to lick the sandals of Paul. And yet Paul was a maggot, a creature who was nothing without Jesus and deserved hell apart from Jesus. And yet that maggot makes us all look like even worse maggots in comparison. Likewise, the Blessed Mother is a creature. She's not a goddess. She was created dependent on God. Jesus created her, owns her, possesses her, saves her, saved her. He created her. He owns her. He's her Savior, her God and Lord. But because he created her to be his mother, he honored her by being flesh of her flesh, bone of her bones, blood of her blood, and exalted her to be his queen mother because she made him a son of David. She made him a son of David. He became a physical seed of David from her beautiful, holy, consecrated virgin body by the Spirit. By being flesh of her flesh, he became the seed of David. By being the seed of David, he became the heir of David, sitting on David's throne, having the key to David's house. Well, if he's the king who sits on David's throne, then she's the queen mother. It's biblical. It's biblical. That's it. You caught it now? So, guys, that finishes the questions I wanted to discuss. Now, again, for those of you who are new here and maybe weak, may the Lord constrain me not to cause you to stumble, but I apologize to you. I don't apologize to the trolls, the filth, the demons pretending to be Christian, masquerading as Christians, pretending to be pious, while denigrating the saints, disrespecting the Blessed Mother, dishonoring the holy apostles and prophets, robbing Jesus of his glory, or robbing glory from those that Jesus has exalted and blessed out of his own free will, perverting the Bible, and pretending to be pious and humble and spiritual and Christ-like as they do so. You're not going to get away with it here. You don't like it, get the hell out of here. See? Like this filthy, demonic bastard, you see? Look at what this filthy, demonic bastard said. He just said Jesus is a liar. Catholics pray to her, a dead woman because, again, he has no respect for his mother. His mother was trash because you can tell she was trash because she gave birth to this trash, this dog. He just said Jesus lied when he says those who believe in me never die. So either he's not a Christian or he just called Jesus a liar, pretending to be a Christian because Jesus said they're not dead, they're alive. But because he has no respect for his own mother, Who's not worthy of honor, he thinks he can dishonor the Blessed Mother. This filth right here. Another filth, another trash hiding behind a fake Nick. You see? Honestly, guys, do you blame me? Be, be up front with me. Don't be like these cult followers of Anthony, Fat Boy, Dodgers, or James White. Do not be a cult follower. Do not be a Shamunia. Pray God will heal me and constrain me and strengthen me. Be bold, but not for praise or money. Do not be a Shemunian. Do you blame me for being this way? Because we don't have enough Christians who are willing to call people out and muzzle them and rebuke them like the prophets and the apostles, thereby getting myself in trouble and putting my life at jeopardy. You know I'm taking a risk. I'm putting my life on the line. Do you blame me, though? If we had enough men doing this, like the early church fathers, used to do it, then I wouldn't be sticking out like a sore thumb. I would be something common among Christians. But Christianity has lost its way that someone like me is so uncommon that people are shocked. When as if you look at the churches, in fact, I'm going to prove it to you. Here, let me prove it to you from the reformers. Ah, let me prove it to you from Anthony Dodger's spiritual fathers. Let me prove it to you. Here you go. Here you go. My attitude is no different than the reformers like Martin Luther, even though I don't identify with them anymore. Let me prove it to you guys. Here you go. And so if Antonia Dodgers attacks me, 
He's a filthy, fat, slob hypocrite because he's attacking his spiritual fathers, those spiritual bastards, the reformers, because I'm acting like them. I would like to think I'm acting like the church fathers, the true saints. But here you go. He's not a Catholic. Frank Viola. What the shocking beliefs of the great Christians can teach us today. Read Grace. He has a section on some of the things that the reformers said and did that will shock you. And he has a section on Martin Luther. Aha. Uh -huh. And he's a Protestant. Okay. So if that fat slob, that inconsistent deceiver attacks me, he's only burying his own spiritual ancestry because the reformers acted worse. And they're my example. I want to act like them. I want to be a Lutheran. You condemn me, you condemn Lutheran, Calvin to hell. At least I don't go around murdering people, burning people, and drowning people like they did. Here it is. The Shocking Beliefs of Martin Luther, page 53. You ready? Here it is. The Shocking Beliefs of Martin Luther. And there's one on Calvin. Let me see. Look what, let, let me read to you what he says. He even warns you, before you read on, keep the following in mind. So he's got to even warn you. What you're about to read about these men is going to shock you. Luther lived in the 16th century. Life was cruel and harsh, and people were generally violent. So he's trying to justify it. Take that into consideration, the time of Luther. While well, you're telling me we're living in better times? Homosexuality on the rampant? Transgenderism? Lesbianism? Trying to sanction man love, pedophilia? Justifying the murder of unborn children? Liberalism, socialism, Islam on the rise? Christians being persecuted, attacked, humiliated, imprisoned, tortured, killed, and murdered? You think these times are better? We're more civilized? Really? All right. To bring this point home, imagine the scenario. Suppose that Christians 200 years from now discover that some of the items were used on a daily basis were destroying the planet. So they may think, how could have those Christians in the 21st century be so selfish and sinful? Again, we have to understand Luther, Calvin, and others against the times in which they live. See, he's trying to soften the impact. All right. First shocking thing about Luther. He hated the Jews. Here it is. Luther despised Jewish people, believing that they deserve persecution. Gassed! Anthony's spiritual fathers. Gas. Okay. Look, look what he says about the Jews. Okay. Watch here. I want to read his language. Luther believed that heretics should be put to death. That means he would have murdered fat boy Anthony. Okay. Luther believed that writing in anger... Using profanity and shaming his enemies by name calling was justified. This is the part I'm going to read. I'm going to read what he says about the Jews, but here it is. What did Luther believe? Here you go, fat boy. Hey, cow, why don't you snip this? Trying to make me look bad? I'm acting like Martin Luther, your father. And John Calvin, that spiritual whore that you think was a gift from God. Here you go, guys. Do you see it? Am I making it up? Let me repeat. Luther believed. That writing in anger, using profanity, swearing, and shaming his enemies by name calling was justified. Let me read. Pages 62 to 63. Clip this, guys. Can someone clip this for me so I can upload it so that when that fat cow tries to slander me, you just buried the reformers, you clown, you fake, because you can't refute me. You have to make it personal. Here, watch here. Marie, if you ever got on Luther's bad side, like Shamoon's bad side, so I'd make a good Lutheran. You'd be wise to run for Kelver. Say what? If you ever got on Luther's bad side, you'd be wise to run for cover. Note his words. Now he's quoting Luther's writings. Anger refreshes all my blood. See what Luther said? Anger. Man after my heart. Too bad he was a heretic. Anger refreshes all my blood, sharpens my mind, and drives away temptations. I was born to war with fanatics and devils. Thus, my books are very stormy and bellicose. 
You think, Luther? Let me go on and read. Church history buffs are well aware of Luther's unkind and coarse tone, as well as his penchant to be angry and bullheaded. In addition, name-calling wasn't beneath him. On this score, Luther wrote, and I quote, I cannot deny that I am more vehement than I should be, but they assail me, fat cow. You assail me, fat boy, heretic, and God's word. That's what you do, fat boy, Antonia Coppersmith, and your daddy, Jimmy Muhammad White. You butcher God's word preaching a false God that's like the Sunni God. And God's word so atrociously and criminally that these monsters are carrying me beyond the bounds of moderation. You think, Luther? Don't forget this clip, guys, when these dogs bark and slander me for acting like they're reformers. Okay? See what God does when he wants to embarrass and silence liars and slanders? Why doesn't he do the rise and fall of my daddy, Martin Luther? The rise and fall of my daddy, John Calvin, fat boy. But I'll do it for you, cow. Yep, St. Elias, here he is. I'm not lying. And he's quoting his works. Get the book. You can find this online, by the way. Regrace, Frank Viola. He did sessions. Search for him on YouTube. Okay, now watch here. And again, quoting Luther. And again, quoting Luther. Uh, Marcel, I'm going to get there. We should take him, the Pope, the Cardinals, and whatever riffraff belongs to his idolatrous and papal holiness, and as blasphemers tear out their tongues from the back. He's inciting to physical violence. Tear out their tongues from the back. No wonder they helped the Turks, the Ottomans, to try to attack the Catholic Church. And nail them on the gallows in the order in which they hang their seals on the bulls, even though all this in mild compared to their blasphemy and idolatry. He's inciting to violence, tear off their tongues and nail them on the gallows. This is Marty for you. Okay. Luther believed that using profanity was acceptable. You hear that, fat boy? Your spiritual daddy. You hear that, fatty? Jimmy Muhammad White? You hear that, cow? Antonia, your ancestry goes back to the reformers. So your spiritual daddy says, I am right to cuss you out, fat cow, fat boy. So why are you getting upset that I'm acting like a reformer? Here it is. Can you see it? I underlined it. Look what he said. Luther believed that using profanity was acceptable. For example, he called the Jewish rabbi's interpretation of scripture Jewish piss and shit. The way the rabbis interpret scripture, that's Jewish piss and shit. Tobia Singer, you're shit. You're piss. The way you interpret the Bible, Luther says, you are Jewish piss and shit, dude. Shit on you and your rabbis. <gasps> I don't think Jathan, you Sam. I don't see Jesus in you. I don't see Jesus. Where's Jesus? <laughs> All right, you watch. He reprimanded his Catholic opponents saying, quote, how often do I have to yell at you? Yell at you like I do? <gasps> I'd make a darn good Lutheran. Guys, I think I'm going to go back to the Reformation. I think I'm going to be Lutheran. Because Marty is a man after my heart. Here you go. Let me just underline it. He reprimanded his Catholic opponent saying, how often do I have to yell at you, you crude and unlearned papist, before you come with scripture at least once? Scripture, scripture. Don't you hear me, you dumb goat and crude ass? <gasps> wait, wait, what did you call What did you call them? Here, I'm going to highlight it. And he gives you the reference to his book where you can read it. Scripture, scripture. You dumb goat and crude ass. You stupid ass. You assholes. 
Eh? I don't see Jesus. Where's Jesus in this? Sergeant D, do you see Jesus? Hey, do, where, where's this Jesus? Well, check it out online, sister, and read it in, in German. Here. In this regard, Erasmus is purported to have said of Luther. Watch here. Erasmus, who debated Luther on the bondage of the will. Erasmus, the prince of the humanists. Look what he says. Watch here. Look what he says, okay? I underline it so you can see it. Uh-huh. Page 63. Erasmus is purported to have said of Luther, God has sent in this latter age a violent physician, violent, on account of the magnitude of the existing disorders. Luther is purported to have once declared. Luther is reported to have once declared. I wrote it after dining, but a Christian can speak better inebriated than a papist can sober. A Christian who is drunk speaks better than a papist, a Catholic who is sober. Even Luther's collaborator, his own buddies, Remember what fat boy that cow said? Oh, we used to rein him in. Luther's collaborator, Melanchthon, Melanchthon admitted, quote, that he could neither deny nor excuse nor praise Luther's coarse writings. Even his own homie, Melanchthon, Melanchthon, what did he say about Luther? Quote, 63, neither deny nor excuse or praise Luther's coarse writings. Okay. On balance, scattered references and crude language would only amount to a couple of pages total in his numerous books. Now that's his books. What about every day, life to life? You only see what he wrote, but what about being with him every day and how he treated people? Now, what did he say about the Jews? Okay. Pages 56, 57. Then we're going to talk about Calvin and open up the Q&A. Watch here, guys. Uh, there is for one truth. You're not a man because you're not going to come on and debate me on 1 Timothy 2.5. Because I swear I will bury you like Luther buried the Jews. And I will take Jewish piss and shit and stuff it in your mouth, courtesy of Martin Luther. But be a man and come on so I can use 1 Timothy 2.5 to take Martin Luther's words, to take Jewish piss and Jewish shit and stuff it down your throat because you're a dumbass, according to Luther. But you're a coward. You're a spiritual bastard. You won't come, you filth. Block this coward. Here, look what he says about the Jews. Pages 56 to 57. Now, guys, be honest with me. How many channels do you know? will give you all these facts that unless you're called to full-time ministry and are researching and will be honest to God and not care for political correctness to reveal this to the, to the masses. Most Christians are afraid to talk this way because they know they'll lose support and won't be invited to conferences. So they're more concerned with their position, their support, and being invited than they are of being honest to God and the church. This is a fact. I'm not lying. So Sam Shimon fan club, can you do me a favor? Sam Shimon fan channel, clip this part on Martin Luther for me and I'll upload it, brother. Please. Okay, now watch here. Let's see what he said is about the Jews. Okay. Page 56, 57. And then I'm going to go do John Calvin and open up QA. We got a fake here. I think another Mohammedan troll. I'm going to make Muhammad cry if he gets out of hand. 56, 57. At first, Luther was sympathetic. Sympathetic to the Jews and critical of Roman Catholics for their mistreatment of the Jews, for treating them like dogs, quote unquote, and thus making it difficult for them to come to Jesus Christ. At first, he was sympathetic. But 15 years later, he changed his tune entirely and began to excoriate the Jewish people in his writings. <clears throat> okay? In his writings. Watch here. 
despite the fact that Luther's, Luther's best friends disapproved of his contra-Jewish attacks. Best friends disapproved of his contra-Jewish attacks, like attack the Mohammedans. History repeats itself. But thank God I'm not Luther, a heretic. Thank you, Lord. Save us. He wouldn't relent. He wouldn't do what? He didn't care what his best friend said. He would not relent. Even Toby, a singer, did a session where he mentions Martin Luther's hatred of the Jews and a book that he wrote attacking the Jews. Here it is, underlined. See? Let's continue. In fact, shortly before his death, Luther wrote, quote, <clears throat> quote, we are at fault for not slaying them. Where do you think Hitler got the notion of wiping off the Jews? He didn't get it from Jesus. He didn't get it from the Bible. He didn't get it from Catholicism. He was influenced by his forebear, Martin Luther. Here it is. Before he died, Luther said, right? We are at fault. We are at fault for not slaying them. Surprise, surprise. Out of Germany, several hundred years later, we get Hitler. Did you know there's a book out? I was listening to Patrick Madrid. Did you know there's a book out that proves that the Pope at that time saved more than 600,000 Jewish lives to the point that in Israel, they planted a tree honoring the Pope that the Protestants slanderously accused of aiding Hitler in exterminating the Jews, a lie from hell. Even the Israeli government acknowledged the Pope and his humanitarian effort of trying to preserve Jewish lives. And they estimate that he saved over 600,000 Jewish lives, and they honored him by planting a tree in his memory in Israel? Did you know that? A fact? I was just listening to Patrick Madrid the other day mentioning it, and there's a bo book. Hey, I'm not lying. Someone should know his name. They wrote a book based on historical sources, and these are not necessarily pro-Catholics, that admit that the Pope behind the scenes saved over 600,000 Jewish lives. And here, Google it. Israel honored him. Israel honored him as a Gentile who tried to save Jewish souls, and they planted a tree in his blessed memory. I'm not lying. Google it. Right now, you'll find his name. Israel honors the Pope, plants a tree in his memory. There you go. Are you going to hear that from the fat cow, Antonia Dodgers, Coppersmith, or J Jamal Muhammad White? You're going to hear that? No, you're not going to hear that. Are you going to hear them mention that their spiritual father, Martin Luther, said, we're at fault for not killing them all in his writings that are still extant? You're going to hear them mention that? Will you hear them mention that? No, I don't think so. Nope. Let me go on. Church historian Roland Baton wrote that it would probably have been better if Luther had died before he wrote his onslaught against the Jews. Wait, 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 wait. What did the church historian say? Let me underline this. Aren't you thankful for these shows? Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Aren't you thankful that the Holy Spirit is guiding us into the fullness of the truth? Had it not been for the Spirit convicting us, I wouldn't discover these sources. Who do you think is allowing me to find these facts so I can silence these liars, these trolls, these demons, these fakes pretending to be Christians and pious and bashing me because they can't refute me, even though their spiritual forefathers did much worse? There you go. There you go. Look what he says. Here it goes. Let me underline it. This is how God protects his children, his servants. And I pray we are all true slaves of Jesus, truly the sons and daughters of God protected by the spirit against these fake who think they're Christian. Here it is. 
So you don't think I'm making it up? Page 56. Underline. You see it? Can you read it, guys? Here, let me remove this so you can see with your own eyes. Okay, here you go. You see it? You caught it right there? Right? The last paragraph, Pope Pius XII, Pedro. So was I lying? Pedro, when's the last time you heard a Protestant mention Pope Pius XII saving over 600,000 Jewish souls and being honored by the Israeli government? Did you check it? Israel planted in his honor. They planted a tree in his honor. Because he saved Jewish souls, that even the Israeli government honors Pope Pius XII for service during Nazi Germany, extermination of the Jews. Focus, guys. Hey, brother Jesse, I'm on the live stream. Can I call you back, my hero? I love you, brother. God bless you. Okay, that was a Catholic warrior. Let me read. Church historian. Roland Baton wrote that it would probably have been better if Luther had died before he wrote his onslaught against the Jews. This is a church historian saying, man, if only he had died before he wrote what he wrote. You know why? Because this church historian sees this was the seed, the seed that Luther planted, Michaela. Behave before you get blocked. Stop pontificating. Austria, it still came out of Germany. Stop it. Okay? This was the seed that was planted that resulted in this Holocaust. Whether you believe it's 6 million or not. Okay? It would have been better he died before his onslaught. Now, in his, Martin Luther's, on the Jews and their lives, Luther stated, page 57 of the book, quote, guys, quote, listen, I advise that their houses also be raised, right here, raised, okay, you see it? I advise that their whole houses also be raised and destroyed. Do you know about Martin Luther, your German ancestor then, Michela? Do you agree with Luther? Michela, say, I agree with my German ancestor, Martin Luther, when he wrote against the Jews, the Jews and their lies, that you Germans should go around raising their houses and destroying them. I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught be taken from them. I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. I advise that usury be prohibited to them and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them and put aside for safekeeping. Tell me this is not what Hitler put in motion. Convince me this is not what Hitler did. Take Martin Luther's words, right? I advise that usury be prohibited to them and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them and put aside <clears throat> for safekeeping. If this does not help, we must drive them out like mad dogs. If this does not help, we must drive them out like mad dogs so that we do not become partakers of their abominable blasphemy and all their other vices and thus merit God's wrath and be damned with them. That's Martin Luther. This is the ancestry of Antonia, Fat Slob, Rogers, and Jamal Muhammad White. Muhammad White. These are their fathers because their doctrines go no further than them. It stops with them. Michaela, now listen and don't distract. And again, again. In some, they are the devil's children, damned to hell. If there is anything human left in them, <clears throat> for that one, this treatise might be useful. One can hope for the whole bunch as one wills, but I have no hope. 
I also know no biblical text that supports such hope. Now the author goes on to say, note that Luther's issue with the Jews didn't appear to be racial, but theological. Luther was frustrated that they rejected Jesus. Just like I am, I can't stand Tobia Singer. And he couldn't convince them otherwise. On this score, he wrote, just as I may eat, drink, sleep, walk, ride, with, buy, from, speak to, and deal with a heathen, Jew, Turk, or heretic, so I may also marry and continue in wedlock with him. Pay no attention to the precepts of those fools who forbid it. A heathen is just as much a man or a woman, God's good creation as St. Peter, St. Paul, and St. Lucy. And yet, he just said about the Jews, if there's any humanity left in them, they are rabid dogs. So then he ends at this part. There's a lot more. Luther also opposed the Jews because of his historicist, historicist eschatology, which viewed the Turks, the Pope, and the Jews as part of a great end-time coalition designed to wipe out Christians under the leadership of the devil. And yet, ironically, the Reformers took the side of the Turks, the Ottomans, and trying to destroy the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church defeated them. Irony of ironies. So, guys, there's a brother here who takes clips of mine. Clip this entire section on Martin Luther's filth, vile language, mocking people, insulting people, and justifying it so that I can then shove it down Antonia Coppersmith Dodger's mouth through his arse when he tries to then slander me but says nothing about his spiritual daddies, his fathers. Now, do you want me to read about John Calvin murdering people? Or do you want me to finish it because we have no questions? Because I was going to end it with this. The questioners ran like cowards. You want me to now read what he says about John Calvin? John Calvin? Up to you guys. And then we're going to wrap up. And don't forget later, we're going to have Robert Spencer. Calvin? All right, here you go. Now, he's a Protestant. He is not Catholic or Orthodox. He's a Protestant. Frank Viola, Regrace. Google him and his book or watch his sessions on YouTube. Okay, here it goes. 69. Here you go. One, Calvin believed, and James White admits this, that executing some unrepented heretics was justifiable. Was justifiable. So I'm going to read where he quotes him. Because it's long. You can get the book. It's worth it. Okay, now I'm going to shock you what he believed. Watch here. Quote, even so, Calvin made this remark regarding Servetus, Michael Servetus, an anti-Trinitarian, who was trying to get even Calvin killed, because that's what they did, kill each other, which means that if Anthony had his way, he'd murder all of us in the name of his false god that he thinks is a god of scripture, showing that he believed death for heresy was justified. So Calvin says about Michael Servetus, who's Calvin's Geneva murder. Quote, but I am unwilling to pledge my word for his safety. I'm not willing to grant him safety. For if he shall come to Geneva... I shall never permit him to depart alive, provided my authority be of any avail. So, hey, Michael, you come to Geneva, I'll do everything I can to get you murdered because you're a heretic. You're not leaving Geneva alive. That's John Calvin, okay? Nine years after his execution, and he quotes him again, one notable remark by Calvin was, quote, I hope that Servetus will be condemned to death. But I desire that he should be spared the cruelty of the punishment of fire. So kill him, but don't burn him. That's John Calvin, right bottom here. I want him killed, but don't burn him. All right. Nine years after the execution, Calvin made this comment when answering his critic, Francois Badoun. Badoun. Quote, Servetus suffered the penalty due his heresies. But was it my by my will? Certainly, his arrogance destroyed him, not less than his impiety. 
And what crime was it of mine if our counsel, at my exhortation, indeed, but in conformity with the opinion of several churches, took vengeance on his ex ex execrable, execrable, execrable blasphemies. So I exhorted them, several churches agreed, and the council of which I am part of, yeah, kill this dude. Let Bedouin, a Bedouin abuse me as long as he will, provided that by the judgment of Melanchthon, Melanchthon, I have our time with these names. Oh, my tongue. Melanchthon, Melanchthon, posterity owes me a debt of gratitude. In time, you will be thanking me for having purged the church of so pernicious a monster. So he's saying right here, in time, generations will be thanking me. Thank you, oh, your highness, you great one, for murdering Michael Servetus. That your Geneva murdered a heretic. They will be thanking me for what I did. Here he goes. Okay, watch. It gets worse. Okay. Calvin is also quoted as saying, whoever shall now control, contend, I'm sorry, whoever shall now contend that it is unjust to put heretics and blasphem blasphemers to death will knowingly and willingly incur their very guilt. So he's threatening you. If you say heretics shouldn't be killed, you will knowingly and willingly incur their very guilt. You're going to share in their guilt. This is not laid down on human authority. It is God, because he thinks he's God's mouthpiece, as this fat slop Dodgers thinks, who speaks and prescribes <clears throat> a perpetual rule for his church. One of Calvin's contemporaries Sebastian Castellio allegedly said this about Calvin. Watch. If Christ himself came to Geneva, he would be crucified. For Geneva is not a place of Christian liberty. It is ruled by a new pope. In your face, fat cow. Even the Christians at that time saw that your daddy, Calvin, your real father, made himself the Pope instead of the Pope. So what did he say? That even if Christ were to come to Calvin Geneva, they would have killed Christ. Why? It is ruled by a new Pope, referring to Calvin, but one who burns men alive while the Pope at Rome at least strangles them first. Okay, let me un underline that. This is James White and that fat slob's legacy. Aren't you thankful God brought me out of this satanic system? And aren't you thankful that God brought thousands of you out of this satanic system? Calvinism and Reformation theology. Here it is. My line. Here it is. Underline. Let me read who said it again. One of Calvin's contemporaries, Sebastian Castillo allegedly said this about him. If Christ himself came to Geneva, Anthony's spiritual daddy's home, because Calvin is a bastard who sired spiritual bastards like Anthony, he would be crucified, for Geneva is not a place of Christian liberty. It is ruled by a new pope, referring to Calvin, but one who burns men alive while the pope at Rome at least Strangles them first. Man, at least the Pope is compassionate. When he wants to put a heretic to death, strangle him, not burn him alive, like Calvin says. Okay. A couple more quotes, and we're going to wrap it up. <clears throat> Summarizing Castellio's feelings toward Calvin. Durant, this is an historian. What he says about Castellio's view of Calvin remarks, can we imagine Christ ordering a man to be burned alive for advocating adult baptism? Did you catch it? Why did Calvin and Geneva murder people? Not just for denying the Trinity like Michael Servitus. Did you know they burned people alive? They murdered people for baptizing adults or rebaptizing people? 
mean that Jamal Muhammad White and Reformed Baptists, and they admit it. Jamal Muhammad White admits it. If I was living at the time of the Reformers, they would murder me for believing in adult baptism. So here, Durant is commenting on Castillo saying that Calvin is the new pope. Can we imagine, right here, page 72, can we imagine Christ, our Lord, ordering a man to be burned alive for advocating adult baptism? The Mosaic laws calling for the death of a heretic were superseded by the law of Christ, which is one of mercy, not of despotism and terror. And then the author, Frank Viola, concludes this section by saying, whether you agree with Calvin's view or defend his actions because he was, quote, a man of his times, unquote, many Christians today find the idea of executing heretics to be shocking. Yet throughout various periods of church history, it was widely accepted. Yep. Now let me read the final paragraph, and you can read the rest of it. Okay. Here's what's going to shock these Calvinist heretics. Here it is. Two, two, do you see it? The black right here? Two. What did Calvin believe? Let me read. Quote, Calvin believed that the Eucharist provides undoubted assurance of eternal life. Undoubted assurance of eternal life. Calvin stated that the sacrament of the Eucharist provided the, quote, undoubted assurance of eternal life to our minds, but also secures the immortality of our flesh, unquote. In context, Calvin is discussing how Christ is present in the sacraments. For Calvin, believers are united with Christ spiritually. It's not that Christ comes down to be physically present in the elements, but that believers are in a spiritual sense taken up to heaven during the Lord's Supper to be connected to Jesus spiritually. Now, what about Calvin and name-calling? Remember what that fat cow is doing? The rise and fall of Sam Shimon? The rise and fall of fat boy Anthony Rogers and his spiritual fathers, John Calvin and Martin Luther. Please, brother, you know who you are, Sam Shimon fan channel? Clip this so we can upload it. The Reformers and their filth. Here it is, number three, and we're going to end it. You see number three? Watch here, guys. No, Anthony, he's a good spiritual bastard of Calvin. He's a Presbyterian, so he agrees with Calvin, pedo baptism. So he's more of a John Calvin worshiper and idolater than James White is. So no, Pedro, Anthony's a good spiritual bastard son of Calvin. He's like Calvin. He believes in pedo baptism. Okay. James is what we call a prodigal bastard son of Calvin. Here it is. You see number three, what it says? Okay, let me read it. How did Calvin talk to people? Sam, rise and fall of Sam Shamoon. Yeah, we used to rein him in. Here, take this, fat boy. Do this. Yeah, look. All right, now watch. Where'd you go? Calvin treated his cr critics with contempt. Calvin treated his critics with contempt, calling them, quote, pigs, asses, riffraff, dogs, idiots, and stinking beasts. Wow. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to being a Calvinist. That's why fat cow Anthony said nothing about my attitude or my issues when I was a Calvinist. Do you see how God humiliates this cow? because I'm using his own measure against his spiritual fathers? Why is it when I was a Calvinist, he overlooked these problems and issues? Because he's a spiritual bastard son of Calvin. And as long as I'm a Calvinist, I'm good. Because here it is. Read it. Here you go. You see it? What did he call him? Calvin. Right there. What did he do? Treated his critics with contempt, calling them what? Pigs, you see it? Asses, riffraff, dogs, idiots, right? And stinking beasts. 
So guys, what does it say about these Calvinists like Fat Boy, the stool of the devil, attacking me for the very things that their own spiritual fathers were notorious for and on a whole worse level? Because these are their fathers, magisterial reformers. Their theology goes no further than them. Sola fide, sola scriptura, no further than them. And they still boast in Martin Luther, John Calvin, and the others who murdered heretics, burned them alive, drowned them, and insulted them in the worst manner possible. And yet, when I was a Calvinist like them, they were okay with me. They had my back. They reined me in. But now that God saved me from John Calvin and Martin Luther and the Protestant deformation to see that these doctrines are the devil, may God save thousands more of Protestants and bring them to the fullness of the truth. Now that I'm attacking his God, his idol, John Calvin, because he's a spiritual bastard son of Calvin, that's as far as he can go. Scripture's not on his side. Church fathers are not on his side. Now he wants to attack me for acting like Martin Luther and John Calvin. Maybe I should go back and be a Calvinist or a Lutheran. Maybe then he'll be okay with me. There you go. So, brother, make sure you can clip this, and we will upload this to my channel. Now, we got one person. Guys, before I conclude, did this still help you? Even though I have to be direct and harsh and bold and politically incorrect, and I have to deal with issues that people don't want to deal with, did it still bless you? And be honest with me. Because you don't need me. The Spirit doesn't need me. But I pray the Spirit will finish the work He's begun in me to preserve me, to glorify Jesus and never shame Him and love Him even unto death. And the Spirit works through me to sanctify all of you for the glory of Christ. Did this bless you? Did this refresh you? Did this challenge you? Did this strengthen you? Did you grow in your understanding? And did it also expose the real motives and agendas of these wicked, filthy blasphemers who hate the ancient churches, who hate the churches that historically go back to the apostles, be it Catholic or Orthodox, Coptics, you name it. They can't stand these churches because their spiritual fathers sired spiritual bastards who hated these churches. Uh, Skylar, I'm about to close your eyes and shut your eyes because you're barking. Sons of Satan, just like Jesus and Paul, call people who perverted scripture sons of the devil. John 8, 44, Acts 13, verse 10. Stop being more pious than the apostles before I have to shut your eyes. Okay? Now, let's see who this guy is. Dunya, I'm warning you. If you're here to blaspheme, I'm going to insult Muhammad. So let's see how far you last. Who are you? Yeah, I'm Dunya. Hi. I called can't hear you. Last time. Did you? Can you hear me now? Can't hear you, buddy. There you go. All right, folks, don't forget. Later, Robert Spencer on my channel. It's going to be 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. New York Time, Michigan Time. Robert Spencer is going to talk about the critical Quran, his commentary of the Quran. All right? Okay, Skylar, sorry about that, brother. I thought you were attacking me. Skylar, I don't know, man. I thought you were attacking me. If you're a brother in Christ who loves me in spite of my imperfections or praying for me to be more like Christ, then this is your channel. Welcome and stay. <clears throat> now, guys, hit the like button, subscribe, and be on for the later stream. Thank you for allowing me to serve you and be used of the Spirit to bless you. Guys, you know I'm under constant pressure and attack. Mohammedans, Calvinists, Fake Christians who think they're spiritual, attacking me, mocking me, thinking they're going to make me change. I need your prayers. If you love me for the sake of the Lord and believe God is using me, please ask your churches, your intercessory prayer warriors, pray hard. Even in your rosary, in your intention, lift me up. Lift my daughters up. Pray the Lord our God and through intercession of the saints, the Blessed Mother, will preserve my daughters and I, granting us divine, miraculous, physical strength, health, safety, security from all threats. Ask the Spirit to make me a physical, bold lion, like David and his fighting men and Samson, not to back down when they threaten me, thinking that if I'm standing before their face, 
They're going to punk me out. They don't know me. Ask the Lord to grant my daughter salvation at a young age, to be in love with Jesus. Ask the Lord to give me the power to love him more, to worship him more, to obey him more, to fear him more, to sin less, be more disciplined. Ask the Lord to give me strong, supernatural self-control, to stay healthy and fit, to keep the weight off, and use my health to glorify the Lord and see my daughters grow up. Ask the Lord that if he tarries, I'll see my children grow up to be godly women and pray for the miracle that I'm with them every day. September, I'm going to see them for a month. But that's not enough. I need to be with them every day. Another man is in their life. A guy who doesn't know Jesus, barely speaks English, also divorced, his wife left him, has his own unruly son to take care of because their mother has not repented of her adultery, chose to marry in adultery, bringing an adulterous man in their life, which eats me up. If I didn't have daughters with her, she can do what she wants. She answers the Lord, but she has my children who are God's children. Pray God will do a miracle, destroy this wicked marriage, and save them from Martin and Michelle so I can raise them up in the love of Christ and oversee them and constrain me from not shaming the Lord, falling into any scandal, or sinning in my anger. But to love Jesus more than my daughters, more than myself, more than the world. And guys, you see, the more they attack, the more people are turning away, and I'm losing supporters. Pray God will purify my heart never to prostitute myself for money. But if God has called me to ministry, I need the support to stay steady. Pray it doesn't decrease so I can provide for my daughters and do the work of the Lord. Even though he doesn't need me, we need him. You don't need me, we need him. And don't ever allow yourself to be called a Shemunian. And don't defend me. When they say I'm a heretic, who cares? When they say I'm a false teacher, who cares? Be zealous for the glory of God. Be zealous for the scriptures. Be zealous for these historic doctrines of the faith. And be zealous for the honor of his saints, the prophets, the apostles, and his blessed mother. Come to their honor, not mine. And I mean it. Don't defend me. We are not cults and cultists and cult followers. That's that fat slab, Antonia, Dodgers, Coppersmith Rogers, and Jamal Muhammad White. They attract cultists who worship them, who swear allegiance to them, not us. We are slaves of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. And exactly, Richard, if you dare slander me, I will muzzle you and shame you for being a dog who thinks he can slander me and get away with it. I will take care of you. No one needs to defend me. So you better not slander me, you filth. And be a true Christian. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again physically, bodily to the earth. May we be united to Christ, washing his blood. May he wash our loved ones, my daughters, in his blood. Fill my daughters, our loved ones, and all of us with the spirit to remain faithful, love Jesus, and not be politically correct, to get more invites, more subscribers or money. Love him and not shame him. Even unto death, until he returns. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Love you guys. Lord willing, see you later.